a very, very warm welcome um, from everyone here at, um, at Garden Court for coming today to uh, those who are here in person and those online. Um, my name is Irena Savic Casey, um, and I am joined today by a fabulous um, list of colleagues uh, and partners in the work that we've all been doing. Uh, on trying to help Afghan uh, nationals. Um, the aim of today's conference is to get together and share ideas, insights, hopefully get some inspiration in this rather bleak time about um, the available legal route and um, other uh, routes to safety for Afghan nationals. Um, um, so before I hand you over to um, our guest speaker, I just wanted to say a few more words about the context within which uh, this afternoon takes place. Um, this afternoon takes place at a time of really significant global turmoil, and it's that context that, to my mind, makes it critically important um, that we give this space this afternoon to examine how we can individually, and perhaps more importantly, collectively, assist the people of Afghanistan. Um, and in particular, how we can assist those who stood up for the rule of law, the promotion and protection of human rights in Afghanistan, and those who worked alongside UK forces and really made the UK personnel's work possible. Um, and all of those terms will be examined uh, to some extent um, as far as the law is concerned during the course of this afternoon. Um, personally, just to say that I am continually humbled um, by the courage and the resilience of the clients uh, whom I represent and who I work with, and I'm often extremely frustrated um, by the UK government's treatment um, of those to whom it made commitments. Um, and it's for that reason that we thought it would be a good idea uh, to set ourselves as one of the aims of this afternoon <coughs> is, is how to channel this perhaps collective frustration into a positive call for action to think about strategic successful litigation, however, whatever success may look like, um, so that we can use the rule of law in the UK to hold the government to account. I just wanted to introduce a little bit of the work that I and some colleagues, some people in the room here have been working on, <coughs> the uh, reform of the Afghan resettlement schemes project. Uh, the way forward, as we optimistically called it, which was a, a report that we uh, did prepared with um, the, with justice, and I was very happy to be chair of that working group. <clears throat> so and that report was finally published, a uh, sort of soft launch, if you like, on the the second anniversary of the um, Taliban takeover. So on the fifteenth of August, twenty twenty three which is in itself an astonishingly long time to record some of the progress, some of the things that have happened in that time, and recognising by then, I think 24,500 people had been relocated, but also recognising that there were 141,000 Arab applications, um, and many of which had still, which had been lodged for, in April 2021, and many of those had not been uh, still decided. And when we look at the processes that were put in place by the UK government, they were able, during the course of Operation Pitting, which was a couple of weeks, we put in place amazing amount of resources and energy, um, particularly with the efforts of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, or FCDO, as I should say, um, in response to what was an emergency crisis. But the emergency goes on. It's quite clear, we just heard from Manira, we're all aware of the situation and we're quite clear that much more needed to be done. Indeed, there are other reports, um, including from Safe Passage, two years of, um, I think, Empty Promises was the title of that report. So it's really critical, I think, for the, to frame this afternoon to understand, to recognise, we understand, I think, but to recognise and, and to identify what went wrong 
and from the outset in terms of preparation and planning. So we knew that the withdrawal of the international forces was going to take place. We knew when it was going to take place. Other countries put in place their, their uh, programs to relocate particular individuals and particular groups of individuals quite early on. Um, and in relation to the Taliban takeover, this is a quote from somebody who was working on the ground in Afghanistan, which was, you could have seen it coming from space. Those are his words. And obviously, um, that is, it shouldn't have been any surprise to anyone as to what was potentially likely to happen and what might need to, happen to be put in place to protect individuals, protect groups of people, and perhaps in a different world, protect the people of Afghanistan from, from that thing that has happened and is now sort of entrenched, uh, as we hear from other commentators. Um, one of the themes of this afternoon, and I'm uh, talking about the re resettlement schemes, will be what should happen, What's the, what in fairness in relation to the people who put their lives on the line to support the UK policy objectives in Afghanistan for over 20 years, need, without which that those objectives of um, counter-terror, counter-narcotics, counter-insurgency, the stabilisation of government and the development objectives, none of that could have been achieved without the absolute commitment and uh, of, the, of those Afghan people who worked alongside the UK, for and alongside, um, and in particular upholding the rule of law and actually where the, uh, the sort of the tentacles of that go into so many different um, organisations and parts of the uh, parts of the government and the governance of, of that country. So, and in, and in particular, as we've just heard <coughs> from Manira, we know what the Taliban have said in general terms about women. So all of those people who worked alongside or for the UK are at risk. But in addition, or in, uh, those who are at greater vulnerability, undoubtedly and without question, must be uh, those women who, who provided that kind of support. And so what the, this report did, and I'm just going to hold it up because I don't think you've got the little <laughs> that link to the report, but just that's the sort of visual look of it to, to remember to remember it by. We just prepared over a, quite a significant period of time. We made a, a series of recommendations backed up with a, a significant amount of research, case studies, solicitors input about clients and um, and things that we had experienced firsthand. So it was very, very well evidenced and a detailed report. But in really brief overview summary terms, because of the time we've got today, reducing delay. Of course, the, the schemes are designed to, to relocate people who are at risk. Five years later is no time to relocate someone who's at risk, particularly people you've made a commitment to. Um, improving decision making and consistency of decision making because we certainly saw that it was very difficult to understand why and some people uh, had been granted and some had not clarifying how the schemes worked again um, there was a real um, lack of understanding in terms of who were deter who were deemed eligible who were prioritized improving communication with the people who were applying so they could understand what was going on, make have some agency about decisions that they needed to make about their own lives if they're in a position to. That is really important and something we definitely noticed was hugely lacking. Transparency through making sure that the data was published about what was happening in the schemes and who was being relocated. Um, and then reviewing the biometrics policy, which is we'll hear this afternoon, has been a real obstacle in a lot of people just getting their application through the door and uh, have, having their fair chance that their applications being processed under whatever route, and including the unsafe journeys policy again, which we'll hear about a bit more this afternoon. And then expedite the expedition, recognizing that some then there needs to be a process by which some people applications can be expedited and that, that should be done in a fair and equitable way. I say that in real in very brief terms because that's uh, I think I'd rather get on to the meat of what we want to do this afternoon in terms of talking about particular challenges. Um, but what I would really want to say is that I do think that the reports that um, Justice and Safe Passage have prepared a very important background reading and information for those who are working in this area, and but also have, and we've already seen the impact of some of the small, uh, <coughs> of them, small changes in policy terms have been made, 
by um, governments. And that happens in a multitude of ways. It happens through lobbying, it happens through cases, it happens through pre-action, repeated pre-action protocol, perhaps I should put it in those terms, but it does work. And that is, and, it, and hopefully there'll be a, a, an element of responsiveness on the part of, of government when they can see that things that are not working point at them in, in really clear terms. Um, and we can definitely see that if something isn't meeting the stated purpose of a policy, then it's failing, and it's failing in terms of lawfulness and questionable about whether it is in fact adhering to the rule of law. And that is what we're going to talk about this afternoon. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Maria Moody, who's actually, I think, going to appear online uh, because she's unwell and she decided better that um, she didn't share her too much information there. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to be talking about the Afghan Citizens Resettlement Scheme, um, which is also referred to as ACRAS or ACRS um, for short. Um, looking firstly at the purpose, process and prioritization under this scheme. And then secondly, highlighting concerns um, regarding how narrow, um, how narrow in scope this scheme is and also how ineffective it is in providing a route to safety for Afghans who remain in Afghanistan uh, and at risk. Um, this is one of the two um, safe and legal Afghan specific routes that has been <coughs> used um, by the government, the other one being ARAP. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure I'm offering much by way of positivity. Uh, it is rather bleak when looking at ACRS um, particularly for those who remain um, at risk and either trapped in Afghanistan or in the region, and particularly for those who share uh, a similar profile to our guest speaker, so judges, <laughs> women's rights activists. Um, there's certainly much more that the government could be doing uh, to honour its commitments under ACRS. So starting firstly with the purpose and process of this scheme, uh, it was first announced in August 2021, uh, and the chronology of ACRS is really important because it's a scheme that has been beset by delays. Um, uh, at the end of these slides, I've set out a chronology with some of the key dates, um, but it wasn't until January 2022 that the scheme was partially opened. Uh, and then after that, it wasn't until June 2022 that the remainder of the scheme was opened. The stated aim of ACRS is to resettle more than 5,000 people in the first year and up to 20,000 in the coming years. And that is said to be in addition to those offered um, leave under ARAP, uh, which itself has no cap. And as I'm sure you know, that if somebody is granted um, <laughs> under ACRS um, as eligible, then they receive indefinite leave to remain with the ability to apply for British citizenship after five years. Um, there are two immediately uh, apparent barriers to accessing the scheme. The first one being that there is no application process for ACRS. Um, and the second uh, being a, a, must be a newly introduced condition um, in the most recent update of June of this year, <laughs> um, which has appeared in the policy, which if somebody in principle is deemed eligible under ACRS, they must <laughs> now uh, provide evidence that they've been able to secure a suitable accommodation in the UK in advance of their arrival. This requirement is so wholly detached from the context. Uh, it's, it's difficult to see how anyone who doesn't have family in the UK um, and who has been targeted by the Taliban and therefore has had their bank accounts frozen um, and is very much living hand to mouth in hiding either in Afghanistan or in a precarious situation in, in another country could ever uh, meet this requirement. I haven't personally come across this in any case being a basis for refusal under ACRS, but I'm flagging it because I think it's one that we, we need to look out for in, in future. <laughs> in terms of uh, prioritization, since the details of the scheme were first published in September 2021, 
Um, it has been repeatedly stated that ACRS will prioritise those who assisted UK efforts, in particular those who stood up for values such as democracy, women's rights, freedom of speech and the rule of law, and uh, will also prioritise vulnerable groups, including women and girls at risk and members of minority groups at risk. And secondly, it's been repeatedly stated that the focus of ACRS will be on people who remain in Afghanistan or in the region. Um, and we will come to see that really the way the scheme is being implemented and operated um, doesn't, doesn't honour either of those two stated uh, intentions. The, the ACRS scheme is it sets out three pathways and to be eligible, somebody you have to fall within one of the, the stated pathways. <laughs> It was pathway one that was opened in January 2022 and pathways two and three that commenced in June 2022. Looking <clears throat> individually at the pathways, pathway one of, of ACRS is primarily intended for those who were already safely in the UK, having been evacuated during Operation Pitting. Um, it also provided for an additional cohort who were well, who can prove that they were called forward for evacuation by the UK government during Operation Pitting, but were unable to board a, an evacuation flight. Um, however, there has recently been an additional uh, exclusionary condition added to pathway one that I've underlined, which relates to whether somebody has subsequently um, managed to escape Afghanistan and has leave in another country that's deemed safe by the UK in which case, regardless of having been called forward, they'd no longer fall within the scope of pathway one now. Uh, pathway two of ACRS set up the referral mechanism for UNHCR's uh, uh, resettlement um, programme. Um, it's only available for those who have already managed to flee Afghanistan and who have claimed asylum in another country. And again, importantly, individuals cannot apply to be resettled and they can't register with UNHCR specifically for the purposes of resettlement. It's um, entirely for UNHCR to identify individuals who fall within their resettlement submission categories um, as set out in the slide and contained within chapter three of the UNHCR resettlement handbook. I think it's fair to say that it's a rather opaque process and it's very difficult um, to get somebody uh, into pathway two. To put in context as well how likely it is um, that any large numbers of people will be resettled under pathway two, um, looking at some um, statistics from UNHCR, at the end of 2022, there was almost 21 million refugees uh, who were identified as being of concern by UNHCR around the world, and less than 1% of those are resettled every year. And looking specifically at the year 2022, when UNHCR made over 100,000 resettlement submissions globally, the UK resettled only 1,200 individuals under this scheme. And importantly, that was all nationalities and from all countries. Um, and so I think it's um, it's clear that any numbers of individuals resettled under ACRS Pathway 2 are going to be um, incredibly small. Pathway 3 ACRS um, is the one that has um, shifted in, in terms of the eligibility criteria since it was first announced. And so for the purposes of comparison, I've set out the terms of the original Pathway 3 scope uh, as of uh, September 2021, which made clear that it intended to set up a referral process for those inside Afghanistan, with particular focus on Afghan civil society actors who supported the UK, um, particularly human rights and women's <coughs> rights activists, prosecutors, and others at risk. When the um, more detail was um, published in January 2022 on Pathway 3, <laughs> you can see that that uh, cohort was then very narrowly circumscribed to three groups only, British Council contractors, Garda World contractors and Chevening alumni. And it was said that there would be a cap of 1,500 places 
uh, on pathway three. The way into pathway three for those three groups was to submit an online expression of interest um, during uh, a window between June and August 2022. That has now closed. Um, and the other important uh, thing to flag is the change in the wording uh, of, of pathway three. Initially, it stated that beyond the first year, uh, the government would expand pathway three um, to include wider groups of Afghans at risk beyond British Council, Guard World and Chevening. Um, and so we were all hoping that from June 2023, that would include a wider cohort uh, in particular, the human and women rights activists, prosecutors and other civil society actors. Um, but now in the most recent version of the ACRS uh, Pathway 3 uh, policy, it refers in more vague terms to um, in the first stage uh, without quantifying or identifying when uh, a subsequent or second stage will commence. I've set out here um, some statistics um, that I have found um, that were published by the Home Office. Um, it There has been a long-standing reluctance and a lack of transparency, transparency um, by the government in publishing any data, particularly in relation to ACRS. Um, and I also think that these statistics must be taken with a pinch of salt because even on the face of it, they are internally uh, contradictory. But we can see um, from the statistics that have been provided that by far the largest uh, cohort that have been granted under ACRS is under pathway one. And I think it would be fair to assume that um, of those, the majority will have been those that were already evacuated um, during Operation Pitting and therefore were already safely in the UK, which does directly undermine uh, the stated priority of ACRS to offer a route um, to safety for those who remain in Afghanistan and in, and in the region. The other data as well uh, is questionable. We can see under pathway three, uh, as of June 2023, there was 41 uh, people granted uh, 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 under ACRS, but uh, in the most recent update of the policy, it made clear that the original cap of 1,500 spaces under pathway through three was likely to be exceeded. Um, so if we were to include uh, 2,000 under pathway three, which is limited to Garda World, Chevening and British Council contractors, that would bring the overall total uh, granted under ACRS to uh, in the region of 12,000 pounds, uh, 12,000 um, individuals. Again, I think it's it's concerning that if the government uh, maintains the overall cap of 20,000 for ACRS in total, uh, it's clear that there are going to be very few places remaining. Uh, and it may be unlikely that pathway three in particular is expanded any further beyond the three groups that have already been identified. To conclude, I've included uh, the case of uh, GA, uh, which was mine and Arena's case. Uh, and this is a case, it's the only case that I'm aware of that, uh, that, challenged, that has challenged uh, the operation of ACRS. It involved um, a female Afghan who has a significant legal and political career that has been committed to um, advancing women's rights in Afghanistan. Interestingly, she mm -hmm. has documentary evidence of threat letters from the Taliban, um, and she remains to this day in hiding in Afghanistan in fear for her life. She, on the face of that, falls squarely within those statements, the overarching statements of prioritisation for ACRS regarding um, those who stood up for democracy, the rule of law and women's rights, and also in terms of the regional prioritisation for those who remain in Afghanistan. It's clear that Pathway 3 was the only route available to her under, path, under ACRS. Because she is still in Afghanistan, uh, Pathway 2 is not applicable and she wasn't called forward for evacuation, and so uh, she doesn't fall within the scope of pathway one. And so following the um, uh, the um, the update that was published in January 2022 uh, of pathway three criteria and eligibility groups, 
um, we challenged the operation and implementation of ACRS um, predicated on, on effectively um, it amounting to a frustration of the policy intention um, and also being a breach of her GA's legitimate, legitimate expectation of being able to access and be considered for eligibility uh, under ACRS within a time scale that reflected the risk that she was facing. Um, unfortunately, the claim was uh, dismissed. Um, Mr Justice Bourne um, gave the government um, a, a wide margin of discretion in terms of how uh, ACRS is implemented and held that the framing of, of the parameters of ACRS didn't depart from the published policy. Um, in particular, the original statement referred to others at risk in, in relation to pathway three, and that was on the face of it, objectively justif justification for uh, including only British Council, Garda World and Chevening alumni, um, and that the policy statements that were repeatedly published didn't meet the threshold to establish a legitimate expectation. I think the GA's case is a classic example on the facts of how ineffective the Afghan specific routes are, um, given the evidence that she has of being actively targeted, the evidence she has to corroborate her career and how it contributed to HMG's objectives. She has been entirely blocked from all three routes um, that, that are available to her. So despite not falling within the three identified categories, she nonetheless submitted an expression of interest under pathway three of ACRS. And as expected, that was refused. And um, it's it's really not possible to challenge that refusal. She applied under ARAP and was refused. And uh, there's now ongoing delay with the reconsideration request. And separately, she submitted um, an application uh, to be considered for leave outside the rules based on her compelling and compassionate circumstances and is facing ongoing barriers uh, related to biometric en enrollment. And that's now subject to a third judicial review challenge. Um, so as I said, unfortunately, there's not much by way of positivity. It is all rather um, uh, bleak. I, I've included, because I believe the, sh the slides will be shared afterwards, just a chronology of some of the key dates relating to ACRS. Um, and also links to the statistics and uh, the key documents, policy documents, and UNHCR's own guidance in relation to pathway two of ACRS. And thank you very much. I shall now hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, so I just want to give a bit more background in more detail, further to what I just said in the opening uh, in relation to the justice report. I might go over this quite quickly. <coughs> Just again, to remind everybody that the background for the Arab uh, scheme, the UK having been at war, obviously, in Afghanistan for over 20 years, and that followed the UN mandate. And that the, I think this is quite important because it was delivered through the comprehensive approach under the NATO mission, but required a combined military civilian strategy. And that is important because when you come to make Arab applications, what you'll be doing is trying to demonstrate how your client's activity or actions or work uh, related to the mission, as I said in the opening. Just as a, for my way of background, the cost of war project at Brown um, estimated the number of people killed directly in the, uh, the violence post 9-11 uh, war in Afghanistan was estimated to be, actually that's a typo, it should be 176,000. An extra zero there, I'm not quite sure why that's there. Um, obviously, several times, many more people have been killed as a reverberating effect of the war. An estimated three million Afghan children are said to have died due, due to the indirect effects of the war. And so, obviously, there needs to be dedicated resettlement schemes justified by the context uh, of the fact of the Afghan civilians who helped deliver the UK mission and putting themselves and their families at risk. Uh, uh, of death or injury and at a significant cost uh, to themselves and the country as a whole. Again, the date for withdrawal, as we know, is the 1st of April 2021, and that's when the policy was launched, the, uh, uh, the ARAP policy. Before the, uh, the ARAP policy and whilst <coughs> um, and before the Taliban takeover, there was still already an intimidation policy that was in place from 2010 to 2013. So for persons who had um, who worked in support of the UK, the 
uh, mission, particularly interpreters at that time. And then the ex gracious scheme that was in place between 2013 and recently closed in November 2022. And so that was for uh, locally employed staff, um, as it was then called, as they were then called. And so um, now all applications that come under a, a scheme of this kind in relation to um, re relocation of persons who, who worked for or alongside come under ARAP. And if um, you're eligible, I don't know if that says ACRS, I think it should also say ARAP, granted uh, uh, ILR, you'll be applied, able to apply for citizenship after five years in the UK. Again, we talked briefly about pitting. We don't necessarily need to spend too much time on that, but that was for that short period of time in August 2021. Um, as to those who were able to be brought, as we've heard from um, from Kabul during that, uh, from Afghanistan, in, but via Kabul, I think uh, in, in particular during August 2021. And there was identified a need to assist other people. This was a foreign office-led um, approach at that time, with a, risk, a need to identify and assist others at risk for persons who've been granted leave outside the rules. And that was in the letter, Home Secretary, then the Home Secretary's letter, and then Foreign Secretary, um, and then Defence Secretary, because we haven't had any continuity there, in the speech delivered on 3rd of August, which was the key points, which is that Arab scheme is not time limited, and that's still the case, and it's still very important. Um, and that what was said, and this should still be um, part of the way that we would say the government should implement the Arab scheme, the government will use every lever at our disposal to secure the safe passage of those who wish to leave Afghanistan. Um, and the government's efforts will uh, in turn do, we're in turn on doing all we can to help remain any British nationals and Afghans who've supported us and whom we were not able to evacuate because we remember those scenes, 28th of August, that was the last flight out. And that was after the bomb uh, at Kabul airport, or near Kabul airport, which meant that a lot of people who were seeking relocation were not able to, uh, to go on flights. So those are the things that were said at the time. Um, and they are, in, the most important one of those, I think, is that our app isn't time limited and there's no upper limit on numbers. And reminding, reminding in any application that that's what was said, these are the people who were affected, those are the people who were always trying to make applications. Um, and when you're looking particularly at the exercise of discretion, or if you're looking at Article 8 balancing exercises, there's no legitimate public interest or proportion of public interest if you're dealing with an Article 8 claim. For example, in saying, oh, well, you know, now that, you know, immigration control will trump that. Those were the commitments that were made and they reason in, in, real, in real terms, what was said was we can't relocate everyone because of by word, by reason of process. But if people have actually got an application in the system, then we will be looking at um, what could possibly be said by the government to, out, to outweigh their, the interests and in their relocation in Article 8 type terms. Uh, just again reminding ourselves of what was said in August 2021 by the then Prime Minister, who shall remain nameless, but um, it was clear that the UK government had a duty to help those whom, to whom we have direct obligations by evacuating UK nationals with the Afghans who've assisted our efforts over the last 20 years. And I'm sure that was a very deliberate choice of words because direct obligations is then open to the interpretation um, that. Um, the decision maker perhaps wants to put on it, but we'll hear a bit more about how the court, what the courts have thought about that from Duran said in, in, in just after this part of the presentation. So the application process for Arab is for Afghan citizens who worked for or with the UK government, and these are the definitional terms that come from the rules and the policy, in exposed or meaningful roles and may include an offer of relocation for those deemed eligible by the Ministry of Defence and who are deemed suitable for relocation by the Home Office. So when ARAP was originally set up, and this is of course before the Taliban takeover, part of, there was a category, which I think is effectively default now, where the decision maker could say, well, you don't need relocating outside of Afghanistan, but it might help you to relocate within Afghanistan. But I think there's a recognition now that that's um, no, longer something that will ever really be, could ever be used. Um, there are those, um, so if you think, if those people who want to make an application, there's an online 
uh, our ap application form. Um, that application can be made from any country, but it's not importantly, and this is what we spent a bit of time arguing about in the Court of Appeal and in the, on the uh, Administrative Court, it's not an immigration application. So the, pro the first thing that happens is it's designed for the, it's a mechanism by which the individual seeks confirmation from the Ministry of Defence that they meet the requirements to be eligible for assistance or relocation under Arab either as a principal or as a dependent family member of an, uh, an eligible Afghan citizen. And then the, when the application is made, um, eligibility is initially considered by the MOD um, and followed by request for information and then an eligibility decision on them and their fam family members included in the application. I think what we've seen from the process, certainly at the early days, but still we see this, is that the MOD were not used to making these kind of administrative decisions that the Home Office are, quite frankly, more routinely make, not necessarily brilliantly, but they are more used to that process of a, getting a set of facts and working out what the priorities are and how to make the decisions. So some of the early decisions were really poor um, and, there was, and there was a recognition, I think, on the part of the government that they needed more training. Um, but. Yeah, but really, the, the idea, the reason the MOD were given that responsibility was because they were the ones who were supposed to know who they'd been in partnership with. There was no encouragement or expectation that they should have narrowed that criteria, or that they should have said, "Well, only let in you know one or two. There was supposedly no numbers limit, no internal um, guidance that told you to take a tell them take a narrow view of of what uh, those working alongside exposed and meaningful roles meant, uh, but. We will see through the course of litigation what has happened in some of those cases. Um, as a matter of practice, then you have 42 days to respond to requests for information. And if you don't respond, it, it may result in, uh, or will result in the rejection of the application, notwithstanding that the government might take 18 months or longer to, to actually decide the application. So again, um, if those things happen, then I think there may be opportunities there, uh, to to, to challenge. Um, and then this is the important part, which we again took quite a significant amount of litigation to work out the to work out this process. If the decision is made by the MOD to say yes, you are eligible, it's, el it's effectively eligibility in principle because then an application is made on, on uh, to the Home Office on their behalf uh, under the immigration rules. And there is an internal referral form or an internal uh, entry clearance form and that's where this then becomes an immigration application as far as the Home Office are concerned um, and so that's where we see that um, and that's how we know from the authorities of SNA that I think Duran's going to talk about that in a, in a moment that an application under ARAP the online application to the MOD is not considered to be an application for entry clearance um, and you know, on any basis, including an application outside the immigration rules for leave outside the rules. And that's just getting to that point was took such a lot of time. It would just been easy if they just said it in one sentence and we would just all knew what we were dealing with. But they didn't disclose that internal referral uh, clearance form. And of course, uh, until much later on in the, in, the, in the Court of Appeal proceedings, what is clear, of course, is that the Home Office might not take the same view of, as the MOD in relation to other matters that relate to the immigration rules, in particular, of course, national security. So that's where a lot of the litigation has been focused. MOD says, yes, they did work alongside us, exposed meaningful roles, yes, they're at risk. They're not asked in that process, it seems, to give a view about whether they pose in Home Office terms a national security non-conducive for public good. Uh, question. So that's why when the, in the second part of the process there's been a significant amount of litigation. Family members, so again this has been a huge amount of um, a lot of backwards and forwards in relation to litigation and confusion. Um, to be eligible for relocation under ARAP, family members must be included in the principal's original ARAP application made to the MOD. Uh, if, you're, if persons who are relocated under ARAP don't have refugee status, so they're not entitled to sponsor family members under the refugee family reunion rules. Um, and so, where an eligible Afghan citizen or their partner relocate under ARAP, family members who weren't 
included in the original ARAP uh, application, this is according to the Home Office's policy, can't later apply under ARAP, but instead they have to make an application to join the family in the UK directly to the Home Office through the visa, the usual, the usual visa route. Um, so again, for many reasons, people might have become separated from their family members, might not have been included in the original application, and though, again, that is all part of um, matters that may end up in litigation unhappily if, uh, if we can't make the applications under the immigration rules. Uh, to be eligible for, for relocation, if you, do, if you were included under the Arab, in the Arab application, um, the, uh, in relation to including the principal's original Arab application made to the MOD, um, where a valid application is made under Appendix FM but the requirements aren't met, consideration will be given to whether to grant entry clearance on the basis of uh, exceptional circumstances or compelling compassionate grounds outside the rules. And upon uh, receipt of an AFM, additional family members application, the MOD will make a request for information. Again, 14 days to respond, a failure to respond will likely result in, in rejection of an application. So. There's a little bit more, uh, a, a little bit of flexibility might be said there, but what you don't know is how long it's going to take for those decisions to be made, and that's where the significant stumbling blocks again have come. We're going to hear this afternoon from Rebecca Chapman specifically talking about delay, but we have seen extraordinary amounts of delay for very vulnerable uh, family members in particular. So we'll we'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on, but that's the sort of um, the, uh, the, the bone, bare bones of the application process. So if you apply under ARAP uh, and you're deemed ineligible, then a person may seek a review uh, within 90 days, um, although there, were, there may be said to be compelling circumstances which have prevented them meeting the deadline so it can be extended in particular circumstances. And the review can be sought where they believe the decision wasn't made in accordance with the law or the, with the policy and where they may have new evidence to support their case that wasn't available at the time the decision was made. So that's quite, uh, sounds quite generous. I mean, in, in, in policy terms, that's, that's quite generous. But again, in practical terms, we've seen so many people who have been refused, even where they've got letters from very senior members of uh, military and so on who've, who've supported their applications. So on the one hand, they say you can't lobby <coughs> People, you know, when you have significant evidence from persons who support your application, oftentimes those applications are refused. Um, there's a review form, uh, again, the usual uh, process point about um, going to the MOD, they can request information. Um, and there's an again eligible principals whose uh, whose additional family members haven't been found to be eligible can seek a, re uh, a review of their Arab additional family members application using the form. So um, pitfalls, of which there are many. Uh, so this is where we get to the. Uh, I, I sort of speeded through that uh, the pr application process point to get to the pitfalls and then to the litigation strategy, which is what we've been engaged with for the last two years. Many people consider that the H uh, that the um, His Majesty's government say, has either forgotten its partners or has been told or seems to be told to forget those who did help in the UK mission. There is a real problem actually with finding anyone who's got any sort of collective knowledge that goes back more than about three years in the Foreign Office and MOD. Um, that is a real institutional memory failure, whether that's deliberate or otherwise can possibly comment, but it, is, it certainly appears to exist when you look at decisions that you see repeatedly. So that's why we do get people who provide evidence from other sources, because they're the ones who say, well, I work for this person, and we've got a client exactly like that I'm dealing with now, and he's got a witness who says, well, I worked in DFID with this, with this man. But somehow, they, we didn't seem to have any, um, you know, you can't necessarily get that from the decision maker, which is, and the longer this goes on, the longer the delays go on, two years, five years, 
you know, the Taliban takeover 2021. Who's going to remember in 2026? Key principles that we see from ar arising from the Arab applications about consistency of treatment. And that was one of the arguments that we were pursuing. Inconsistency of treatment is a principle of public law. It's a species of rationality. It's per the Supreme Court decision in Gallagher, it is, it is um, something that you can, if you can identify it through evidence, that's the difficult part. Um, which is why, which is why disclosure and Part 18 uh, applications are really important in part, part of this process. If you can identify inconsistency in treatment, you may have the beginning of a of a claim, and indeed that's something that we developed through the justice report. That's what we were able to identify. Um, another thing that I think we're leading directly into, hopefully, where Duran is going to speak, but on the rules and the policy guidance at the beginning, the policy guidance and the rules didn't match. Then there's been various iterations of the ARAP rules, which have changed every couple of months uh, con and consistently. And so um, hopefully we'll, there is a sort of, uh, you need a route map through look, making sure you've got exactly the right policy statement uh, in relation to, and rule in relation to the decision, uh, the application that you make and the decision when it's made. And then the relationship requirements between ARAP and LATR, which is, as you so LOTR just is leave outside the rules. It's any discretionary application. It isn't Afghan specific. There is an argument that should be, it should be. Um, the Arab application form can't be used, remember, for, for an LOTR application. That was put into the guidance in uh, May 20, March 2022, I think, specifically to stop people who are doing it, which is what we had been doing, because we're trying to say, this is Arab. The discretion, well, we, it seemed to us that there was at least discretion under category four, which was special cases. And if you didn't qualify under those, well, the, the, the way that category was um, being interpreted by the decision makers, then there was discretion uh, largely uh, to be exercised by the Home Office to, to allow people to enter. And that's where there's been a, a, a significant amount of tension, both in terms of substantive outcome but also in terms of um, barriers to access. So that remember the, describing those two routes, ARAP applications, online form, if you're granted, you go into the internal referral system through to the Home Office. LOTR, you're stuck in, a, stuck in a system trying to give your biometrics, trying to get your application form in, trying to get, biomet trying to get a fee waiver, whatever it is. And that's where a lot of those cases, even human people with family members here, show, for example, how differently they've been treated by comparison with people from, in, from Ukraine with family members in the UK, as an example. So that's where we think there's potentially some room for um, development, legal development. Um, today, of course, uh, which we've already talked about. But I'd just like to finish there because talking about those pitfalls, um, it's, it's a really important place to hand over to Duran to talk about where we've got to in the legal uh, progress. I think there has been quite a significant amount of legal pro progress and there's still quite a long way to go. So I'd like to just hand you over to Duran now to take you there. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon, and uh, thanks very much, Sonali, um, um, for handing over to me on both on that point of legal, legal progress. So my talk is um, is going to be mainly about the, um, the developing case law under ARAP in the last uh, in the last few years. Um, I'm going to focus um, initially, at least on category four, which is a special cases um, category. So for non-employees and non-contracted service providers to, um, to HMG, because that seems to be where the main kind of legal controversy has arisen. And uh, in contrast, one, one, certainly one, a, a few of the earlier comments earlier on, um, I'm going to have some good news um, to give people about the developments in the case law. I'm going to be talking about two cases, particularly in 2023, 2023, which I think are actually really beneficial and really helpful. So I'm going to talk about those first. Um, then I'm going to talk about a couple of the older cases. And we say older cases, we're going back to kind of 2022. So I don't know, brand new cases, but this is just an indication of how quickly immigration law moves on. But yes, yeah, so I shall talk about the older cases. Um, which weren't as positive as far as category four is concerned, um, and how we distinguish those cases from the two new cases that have, uh, that have, that have been decided, because they're all on the same level, these cases are all, all high-court judicial review, judicial review cases. 
Um, and then I'm going to um, then I'm going to just kind of could kind of develop a little bit on from one of those cases and talk about one further untested argument that we might use that is a kind of development on from one of the 2023 positive cases. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more um, broadly about the categories generally in relation to the question of reasons. And that's where I've got some second bit of positive news, positive developments on the question of reasons. Um, and, and what we might be able to do about about that going forward, and then I'm going to round up just by talk, just by mentioning quite quickly national security uh, and a couple of cases dealing with um, dealing with national security. Okay, so that that's where we're going. And let me just hope that this works again. Yeah, category four. Okay, so here we are, category um, category. By the way, if I ever start talking and what I'm saying doesn't seem to match with what's on the screen, do, do stop me and I'll kind of go back and try and work out what's gone wrong. Okay, so um, category four, special special cases. Um, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm talking here specifically about the case of CX1 and others decided in 2023, uh, earlier on in 2023. And you can see I've put up there the, um, the text of um, the, the, the most important and the most controversial um, criteria. Um, which relates to non-employees, non-service providers. So you have to have worked in Afghanistan alongside a government department in partnership with or closely supporting and assisting that department. That's condition one. Then you have condition two, which is you must make a substantive and positive contribution towards HMG's military or national uh, security objectives with respect to Afghanistan. Um, and then we know we've got, we've got conditions three and conditions four, which are which you have to satisfy one or other of conditions three and conditions four, and that's risk or somebody who's got information that the disclosure of which would harm the UK's interests. Um, okay, so CX and others concerned journalists, mainly BBC journalists, some of whom had gone out um, onto the front line with the UK's armed forces. Um, they had reported positively on the ideas about democracy. They had um, been critical um, of, the, um, uh, of the Taliban. Um, and they had actually spoken about Afghan people's own experiences. So they'd given a voice um, to Afghan people. So you can see immediately that these are really quite broad areas of engagement with HMG's um, mission. And the first point that was made um, in um, CX quite is the obvious point, which I put at the first bullet point there, which is that um, contrary to what the Home Office had decided, working alongside does not mean necessarily working for the HMG. And that's obvious. Why would you have a criterion that says working alongside in addition to or after as an alternative to working for uh, an HMG government department? So that was the obvious point. So once we shoved aside that point, uh, and we get on to the more substantive misdirection which the Secretary of State had allegedly made. Um, and, and, and it's not often that you kind of engage with a kind of textual analysis of a judgment, particularly in public law, it's kind of more, kind of gen generally more conceptual than that. But here I think we should do, because what Lane, Justice Lane said was, uh, and this is the second bullet point there, significant activities that are closely aligned with democracy building activities may be sufficient. So uh, it, 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 it is the activities themselves that have to align with the objectives and activities of the HMG mission, which is critical. Not that you have to have a specific link with HMG, with a particular department, not that you have to know somebody within HMG and have kind of directly liaised and worked uh, alongside them, but simply that your activities, the, acti the, sub the substance of what you've been doing, aligns with democracy building activities, which is a lot of what the HMG, uh, HMG's um, uh, activities were about. And I think that's really important, really broad uh, and really useful. That goes to condition one. The third bullet point down, <clears throat> very, very similar point, but that actually goes to condition two, the contribution. Significant contributions to the building of democratic open and transparent systems and informing Afghan population uh, of, for example, corruption may be sufficient. So again, you've made a significant contribution to these ideas, to these to, 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 the, to, to the idea 
and the process of democracy building, stabilizing Afghanistan, open and transparent systems, systems of democracy and so forth. Obviously, the judicial system falls within this. Obviously, support for buttressing and building up the judicial system falls within this. So too does um, democracy building activities like um, uh, developing an independent and robust um, media. Um, for within this, so um, um, so the Secretary of State's decision was quashed on the basis that it uh, that they had misdirected themselves by focusing too narrowly upon links that one might have to show with particular HMG departments, substantive direct links, um, actual links working alongside um, directly with individuals at HMG is not something. Um, that you have to show. And as I say, these were all BBC journalists working in one form or another uh, in democracy related activities um, for uh, in Afghanistan. Okay, so um, that's the um, that's the first case, um, uh, CX1. And I just move on to the second case. Now, this was only decided um, very recently, I think on the 14th of July. Uh, 2023, and there's been some controversy about whether or not the Home Office is going to the uh, Home Office, the, the SSD is going to appeal this or not. Initially, they said that they were going to appeal it, but now we just heard from a colleague very, very recently that um, that actually they conceded a case um, on the basis of the, the the development in the law that is that, that is established in this case. So it's not clear whether this decision is going to be appealed yet. Possibly not, possibly not, which would be fantastic. But even if it is, this is the law, as it's, even if it is appealed, this is the law as it stands at the moment. Um, and um, in this case, um, um, what you had was a judge um, who had worked for the primary court for external um, security um, in um, Kabul in 2008. To 2009, 2008 to 2009. So doing all the kinds of things that you would expect would quintessentially fall within CX1. Uh, investigating, prosecuting, convicting Taliban members. I mean, how, how much more direct can you, can you have in terms of support for the UK, the HMG's mission? Um, um, but yet he was found not to fall uh, within category four by the SSD because the FNCO's partnership with that particular court, the primary court for external security in Kabul, had not been engaged and ongoing until 2015. So because he'd only worked there between 2008 and 2009, and then he'd gone off and worked for another um, legal body in Afghanistan interpreting legislation, I think it was, he was found not to, um, not to qualify. And it's a really strong decision. It's Swift, uh, Mr. Justice Swift, who's obviously very senior in the Appellate Court. So it's something that's going to be taken very, very, very seriously. And he said things like, look, um, focusing in on these peripheral questions, like um, um, uh, uh, was he known to some particular civil servants who were working in Afghanistan uh, at the time? What's the particular court that he was working in? Uh, did it have some kind of direct relationship with um, the HMG's um, it, it, it mission, people, civil, uh, the civilian, civilians that were um, promoting uh, rule of law and access to the rule of law? All of that kind of stuff, was he being paid by, was he funded in some way by HMG's mission? All of that is peripheral. It quotes risks missing the wood for the trees and it's not something that should be at the forefront of the Secretary of State's consideration in deciding these Category 4 applications. That, that's the first important thing he said. The second important thing he said is actually conditions one, I'll just flip back, so you can see, conditions one and two need to be considered together because they, 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 roll, they roll with each other. So you can't just get down to uh, condition one and say, oh, well, you know, didn't work with the HMG department. And so, and so you'll see some decisions. Some decisions say, didn't work with the HMG, uh, with the, with the HM, alongside an HMG department because not supported by HMG, hasn't built a case. Stop there, underline, finish. And don't, even, don't go on to consider anything else. He said you've got to consider condition one and condition two together. And in fact, quotes again, condition two is actually more important. So the real focus in these cases now is whether or not 
um, there is a substantive and positive contribution towards HNG's military or national security objectives with regards to um, Afghanistan. So we are really we'll go back again now to uh, 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 go, go back again. So we really are, as I say in the third bullet point here now, focusing in on the substance of the work, the quality of its work, the longevity of it perhaps, the intensity of it perhaps, and its contribution to HMG's objectives. That is what is now key, according to um, uh, Mr. Justice Swift. And the final thing to, uh, to, to, to bear in mind in relation to um, uh, LMD1 is that it's one of those rare cases where the judge went on and said, I'm not only quashing this decision, but I'm making the finding that the Secretary of State couldn't come to any other rational conclusion about um, what, the, what the outcome should be in this case. Condition one and two are effectively satisfied. You'll see it was crossed and still goes back because they have to condition, consider conditions three and <coughs> conditions four. But as far as conditions one and two are concerned, he said Secretary of State couldn't have come to any other conclusion. So please read uh, that case. I've given you the uh, paragraphs there. I know we're all busy lawyers and everything, but read paragraphs 11. If you don't read anything else on these cases, you've got a category four case. Read paragraphs 11, paragraph 11 and paragraphs 19 to 22. It's quite a short judgment and it'll give you a really good kind of, um, uh, a really good kind of start up as to where to go <clears throat> on these category four cases. Okay, so um, yeah, yeah, so stepping back to some of the older cases now, which said something a little bit different, um, going back all the way to 2022. Um, the first of these cases I'm going to mention is uh, our S against the uh, FCO 2022 decision. And here, again, similar kind of decision on the facts um, as in um, the, the LMD decision. The, um, there were two cases actually, it was S and um, JZ, um, sorry, AZ, AZ, I keep getting mixed up the numbers, yeah, S, yeah, JZ is the other one, S and AZ, and they'd been refused because um, uh, they'd worked in the, pro they were judges, they'd worked in the provinces, and so, um, you know, it was said that the UK was, wasn't engaged in the, pro in the provinces, H no HMG uh, department, um, had built a case. There was no um, cases that they dealt with, even though they were dealing, they may be dealing with terrorism and national security cases, which were of specific interest to the UK. Um, those kinds of reasons were given um, for the refusal. Should this play a role now? Should this play a role now in deciding cases um, that are decided? Um, I, I, the answer is, I think, no. First of all, um, first point, and as I put the point there, uh, uh, bullet point one there is that the, the actual issue that was live in S and F and S and, S and against the FCO was not the construction of the policy, not how it should be interpreted, but simply the question of whether or not there was an inconsistency between how they had been treated and how certain other uh, Afghan judges had been treated who had applied under ARAP and under LOTR earlier on in 2021. So there isn't a submission about the construction of the policy at all. It is not a case about the construction of the policy. Second, and in any event, the policy that was, I personally said that the policy changes every two months, the policy that was under consideration uh, in that case was the policy that had been in force as of firstly April 2021, but then as amended slightly um, on the 15th of September 2021. I haven't got this up on the slides, but I'll just read out um, how Category 4 then read. It said, the cohort eligible for assistance on a case-by-case -case basis are those who worked in meaningful enabling roles alongside HMG in extraordinary and unconventional contexts and whose responsible HMG unit builds a credible case for consideration under the scheme. So it, the, the wording is completely different to, to the wording that I've got um, uh, under the slide um, for, um, uh, for the other two cases, um, which came in in February 2022. It, it, it talks about meaningfully, meaningful enabling roles. Well, as soon as you start talking about meaningful enabling roles, you are you're, you are tilting towards more of a direct connection between HMG departments 
and the activities that are being engaged in by the applicant. Because the work that the applicant then has to do has to enable the HMG department in some way. Then it says extraordinary and unconventional context, which is, a, you know, however you view it, it's a quite a high threshold test. And whose responsible HMG unit builds a credible case? Well, you know, <laughs> that suggests that you've got to, possibly that you have to be working directly with the HMG unit in order for the HM unit um, to build a, 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 a credible case. So even within that short five lines, there's three examples there of clear, distinct differences between the policy then and the policy now. So my point is, A, I just said the first point first, actually, uh, the policy is completely different, so therefore it doesn't apply. Um, but in any event, the earlier case, R RS and uh, FCO, wasn't the case about the construction of even that policy. Um, so that's how, to, um, that's how to deal with that. And, um, <clears throat> and, and I think that you can deal with this next decision JZ in pretty much exactly the same way. JZ um, had been um, um, had worked again a, a judge who worked in uh, in terrorism cases um, but had not worked in Kabul at the same at the relevant time. Therefore, refused um, on that basis. But the submission itself um, was a submission that related to consistency with the earlier cases, insofar as um, the substance of the JR was concerned. There was an application for permission and an application for permission to appeal in, in respect of construction, but it's only uh, of the policy, but it's only an, applic it's only an application um, for um, permission and therefore uh, to the Court of Appeal and therefore is not binding. <coughs> it did go to the Court of Appeal uh, on the substantive question uh, of consistency of the policy, as I've said there in the third, third bullet point down. But the Court of Appeals decision was only a permission decision as well, and it expressly says at paragraph 38, as I've noted there, um, that it's not citable because it's only a permission decision. Most Court of Appeal permission decisions are not citable unless the court says we're making an authority out of this case, even though it's only a permission application. So again, wrong policy, a different policy, no binding rule, no binding ruling upon the question of construction of the policy uh, in any event. Um, and therefore, in answer to the question that I raise at bullet point two there, does this cut across LMD1 and CX1? Answer has to be a resounding, a resounding no. The last point I made about that point, or the bullet, final bullet point there, is that what's, you, you, you'll find this other decision, uh, RJZ SSHD, uh, 12th of June 2023, um, it was a separate JR brought to a refusal of LOTR, which was the alternative application that was made in that case. And you might find that quite useful because it, it, it suggests that um, even if you don't get home uh, under ARAP, the kind of considerations that are relevant to getting home under ARAP, because this was kind of, JZ was a kind of near miss case, under our app, it was, if you look at the underlying materials, acknowledged to be a near miss case. Um, though, i.e., this person was working in support of HMG's objectives, etc., etc., we'd say they would now fall within the, um, fall within the uh, present policy, um, are still relevant to whether or not you'd succeed under an LOTR um, application. Jay said, I think it's not, it was subsequently refused, and that's probably going to be challenged again, but. I mean, even after the success, the success in the JR, it was then subsequently refused again. But the important point here is that the, the, the facts of the case, the fact that they were close, even on the Secretary of State's assessment, to satisfying Arab was relevant to um, uh, was was relevant to the um, uh, uh, to an LOTR application. Okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, Okay, I, I've just given you a slide here about making your case because I think it's just important just to bring together, given what I've said about um, uh, CX and LND1, what the object, the HMG's uh, mission objectives were. Uh, and I've set them out there, I won't go through them, but let's just take just, just very quickly a judge for an example. A judge would very obviously fall in. Um, um, countering national security 
um, under bullet point two, if they are convicting terrorists or sitting in the National Security Public Security Court, or countering or dealing with drugs cases, or dealing with corruption cases. And I say that very obviously forward then. But in a broader sense, a judge, taking again the example of a judge, would also fall within um, all of this. If they were, for example, if they worked for a long period of time, albeit not in these kinds and not dealing with these kinds of cases, just dealing with ordinary, civil, family, whatever cases it might be, worked for a long period of time um, um, and had been had shown a kind of genuine long term commitment to the legal state system of justice. And I say that because there's some really interesting kind of papers around, and the one I'm using in my case, I'm doing at the moment, is a paper, called, paper from somebody called Nina Patel, who was the, the government's senior justice advisor in Helmand. <clears throat> and you can get, you go on the Bingham, she's, she works for the Bingham, she's a barrister, but also um, works for the Bingham, the, uh, uh, the Center for the Rule of Law. And what she says is that there's this contrast between the Taliban system, the customary system, and the state system. And a lot of HMG's effort, for example, was put into prioritizing, building confidence in the state legal system over and in contrast to the Taliban system. And that, she says, absolutely central, absolutely critical to combating the Taliban, because you are trying to win the hearts, battle of hearts and minds, you're trying to get people on side to use the state legal system and to push and thereby to push the Taliban out. This was a cultural war as much as, and a political war as much as it was a physical war. That's what she's basically saying. So somebody who'd been central to that, even if they're not sitting in the corruption court, cut, cut, sitting in the drugs court, sitting in the anti-terrorism court, is still central to the battle against, um, battle against the, the, the Taliban. Um, so getting, gaining the public's confidence, and you might get you might get testimonials saying your judge, great longevity, sat there, had a lot of integrity because there was a lot of concern about corruption uh, in the in the state legal system, people opting for the Taliban system in, instead. So there's all sorts of evidence you can use to build up a case where it doesn't appear to be an obvious case falling within those the, 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 those those three forms of uh, cause, which were very obviously. Uh, bring it within the policy. Uh, okay, I said that I was going to say something about um, whether or not it's possible to move the law on a little bit, even beyond uh, LMD. And, and I think it is because I think another possible extension that we might try is that not only should we consider, this is going back to category four, but not only should we consider categories one and two together, but also risk as well. It's not enough just to stop at working alongside and material contribution. You've also got to consider risk because if the essential mission of HMG was to remove the Taliban, to, re to get rid of them, to confront and frustrate the Taliban, what better evidence could you have of that than the way in which the Taliban has reacted to the individual? If the individual has been targeted repeatedly, um, or if the uh, country material demonstrates that somebody in the applicant's position is targeted repeatedly, what better evidence could you have that this is somebody who is um, working alongside the HMG in order to try to remove the Taliban? It, it, it's relevant, it's relevant material. And although um, LND, L, LND1 does say that conditions one and two are clearly distinct from conditions three and four, as I said that, it doesn't actually focus on this question of whether or not risk, as a matter of fact, is relevant to conditions one and two. So that's another that's another point we might where we might try to develop a lot. And I've given you a couple of um, uh, uh, case ref uh, uh, paragraph references to earlier cases which help or don't deal directly with that submission, but which help in it with it. S and S and uh, A Z there. <clears throat> The essential concern of category four is the applicant's degree of vulnerability. So that gives you kind of an overall kind of approach to category four. Vulnerability is relevant. And there's also a really good quote in MKA 2023 uh, at uh, paragraph 53. I won't read it out, but it's there for you. It says, it says something very, very similar. The essential concern of the whole scheme, says Mrs. Justice Foster, um, is, is very much focused <clears throat> upon the risk um, to the um, to the applicant. Okay, 
second set of second set of important um, uh, and positive developments relates to reasons. It's absolutely crazy that the law got off to a bad start in 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 in, in, in CX one in suggesting that um, reasons beyond generic reasons don't need to be given in these cases. My view is it, it, it's, it's just absolutely obvious that um, with a, dis a decision of the importance of this kind, where you've got no right of appeal to an independent uh, review um, or, or body, um, that you should be given more than just generic reasons. CX1, as Justice Lane said, no, you don't need to have reasons because there's a need for speed, translation, vast numbers of applications, we're doing what we can, duty to give reasons is attenuated, etc., etc. But again, LND1 comes in uh, in June 2023, um, with SWIFT saying, um, actually, it's obiter, unfortunately, but actually, if I had to decide this question, because he crossed it on for other reasons, if I had to decide this question, uh, I would decide it, I would not follow CX1. Um, I would say that uh, reasons, albeit they, ha they, have, they can be short, um, have to be provided. Two other cases, MKA and ALO, aren't quite as strong on reasons, but I think that you can get from them, I think you can get from them that they support LND1 rather than CX1. So three against one, reasons should be given. <coughs> even and beyond that, even if you were to follow CX1, I think there are some ways around it because um, Lane says that, albeit reasons weren't required in this case, reasons are always shaped by context, which shaped by, shaped by the requirements of fairness in the particular case. And so let's just take one, one, one quick example of where context might mean that reasons has to be given. Let's say that you've got a decision, the decision is against you, you only got basic reasons on review, um, you only got generic reasons, you JR the decision, you get, a, you get one of these kind of review panel notes which says, oh, well, actually the reasons were this, that, and the other. Reasons that you couldn't have imaginedly imagined would be the reasons at the time that you were putting the application in in the first place. If you then put a witness statement in to the JR saying, oh, if I'd known that these were the real concerns all the way through, that I've been going through this initial decision, this review process, et cetera, et cetera, then I would have engaged. And these are the reasons that I would have, I would have, I would have responded to these reasons that have been taken against. I would have responded to these points by explaining that I was sitting in this court or I was working for this women's organization. This is the specifics of what we were doing. And this is our connection uh, to, HM, uh, to HMG. So what I'm saying is that if you can actually show that the failure to give you reasons initially respond, resulted in a lack of fairness because had you known what points were being taken against you, you could have engaged with them and you could have dealt with them. Well, then you'll be able to show, you'll be able to get out of even CX1 by saying that in this particular case, the requirements of fairness, which are always contextual, were required that I be given reasons as to why <clears throat> I've been refused. Um, lastly, I won't go through this in detail, but last slide, reasons in national security cases. So <clears throat> where national security, two decisions there, which are actually decisions about, um, taken by the Secretary of State. So Nolly said that initially the decision on eligibility under ARAP is taken by the MOD, and then if you succeed, it goes to the Secretary of State. One area that's kept kind of, you know, cosily by the Secretary of State to herself, is the question of um, whether or not it's not conducive to admitting you to the UK. So you satisfy the criteria, then the Secretary might come in and say, oh, yeah, but you're, you know, for national security reasons, we're not letting you in anyway. And that's what happened in these two cases. And in that situation, the normal common law approach, duty of fairness requires reasons, yields to competing overriding policy requirements because it's not consistent with um, national security itself to be open and to explain to you what the actual reasons were. And so, um, and, and so the, the, the duty to give reasons doesn't apply in that situation. And not even, so said, um, both ALO and FMA, can you get into Article 6? Article 6 would normally say, it, 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 even in a national security case, that you've got entitled, an entitlement to know at least the basic reasons, the basic gist. But Article 6 is not engaged by immigration decisions relating to entry, and that's what those two cases again confirm. 
uh, and so you're not even entitled to the gist. However, as I say in the final bullet point there, if you do JR the decision, um, you'll get into a special advocate procedure in the, in the High Court whereby the special advocates will get disclosed to them the reasons for um, the decision. And actually, if you look at the, both of those cases, even in both, even even though the Secretary of State had originally said, I'm not giving you anything, not even the gist, etc., some reasons were still disclosed in open to the applicant themselves. But, you know, national security, few and far between, the news is good as far as reasons is concerned for the vast majority of cases. Okay. I'm really sorry to have gone over time. No, no, I think I was, thank you very much, uh, Durand, for that. Um, I think it was very positive hearing the there's a positive somewhere. There is. Some, it is good to have some positive news, and it did start badly. I think you're right, yeah, 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 yeah. because the government had so much uh, holding their hands close to their chest, so to speak. So, and the court has become, has always had some sympathy with the client group, but just, that didn't have a very clear idea or navigational tool of how they wanted things to go, and in particular refused permission on the construction of the policy point, which is why it wasn't taken in the some of the early cases like SNAZ. They were refused permission on that. Uh, right up to the Court of Appeal, actually. So, I mean, um, in a sense, it's good because um, because then they subsequently they changed the policy. Yeah, yeah, that policy change is very and significant. It, it's important that they. I'm mean, God knows what they thought they were doing. I mean, did they did they think that they would change? Did they think that when they changed the policy that it would result in it being interpreted differently? I mean, don't I mean, don't change your policy if you want if you if you've got a judgment in your favour and you want to hold that line. Don't change it because as soon as you change it. Then people think, oh well, this change must must be. Yeah. Must, I mean, must, they changed the policy in something. September twenty one and December twenty one to make it more difficult. Yes. And they said we're trying to make it more difficult because we're having inconsistent decisions and nobody knows how to apply it. But then they change it again in April twenty two, yeah. yeah. and that change of wording, I think, really because we did fall down on the meaningful, enabling, extraordinary, yeah. and conventional. And once you ditch that, I think the court's view of the process, which makes more sense as to now we can, how you get the LM. D1 judgment, which we could didn't get from the earlier judges, even including even the Conservatives, um, makes a lot of sense. But I think it's a very straightforward application of the policy, and I think <laughs> by Swift and LND1, and that did really change the, the sort of change the dial on all of those cases. Anyway, you've all been sitting here very patiently, and you've actually have been here. Uh, everyone arrived early, which is very uh, well good. So please do have a break, and we'll come back at four. Welcome back, all. Um, I am here to introduce um, very distinguished speakers for our second session in the afternoon. And we have um, three lawyers from Garden Court Chambers who are flanked by uh, two amazing um, NGO workers who have got experience of working with Afghan nationals uh, in the UK. Um, and we will all collectively be talking about the challenges faced by Afghan nationals uh, in coming to the UK, a little bit about once they are in the UK uh, and other immigration routes that are available apart from ACRS and ARAP, which we've already looked at. So um, the first of our esteemed speakers is uh, Gemma Withers, who is a founding trustee of uh, Law G, a charity established in 2021 to support Afghan refugees who may have come across the organisation. Um, I certainly have, and they do uh, fabulous work. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Over to you, Gemma. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today to talk a little bit more about Law G, our beneficiaries, the work we do. I will touch on some of the challenges, as Irina said, about life for our participants, our beneficiaries here. But I also wanted to vindicate the efforts that I've heard about today to help Afghans <coughs> arrive here in the UK to show what successes and benefits can come to everyone once they've arrived. So Law G was founded in 2021 in response to the evacuation from Kabul. So we heard earlier about some of the government workers from the UK who have been in Kabul working alongside Afghan colleagues. And it was two of those who were the founding trustees who said, there's this group of our colleagues arriving and we need to see how we can help. With permission, I'm going to share another of our um, participants' words to begin with, named Fahima. I'm going to read out her testimony first before I give a bit more information. She worked as a judge for a decade in Afghanistan 
and for five years at the Anti-Corruption Serious Crimes Court, where I rendered decisions on corruption cases committed by high-ranking officials, including deputy ministers, mayors, generals, governors, and members of parliament. Prior to this, I sat in the criminal division of the Court of Appeals and the criminal division of the primary court. I took my job and responsibility to be independent very seriously. I decided on cases and evaluated the facts and interpreted and applied the law to the facts of the cases before me consistent with my oath. On the 15th of, October, of August, 2021, the Taliban took over the country and everything came to a halt. At the urging of my family and friends, I reluctantly left the country and came to the UK to continue my life in a peaceful place. From the start, I felt the outstretched hand of Lord G. Their generosity was not limited to giving talks about different sections of law in the UK, but they have tried to help me with my language fluency on a path to a good future. I have become more experienced and have gained a well of knowledge from participating in classes every week about the introduction of the UK legal system and getting the chance to meet guests and ex experts in the topic area. Your punctuality, professionalism, kindness and humanity have inspired me. I have also benefited immensely from our excellent English classes, which increased my understanding of the full skills of reading, writing, listening and speaking. <laughs> Thank you to our teacher for creating such a friendly environment and for the cultural information that was shared at our English classes. So in Fahima's testimony, we see both explanation of what we do at Lordly, so providing English lessons and providing um, education about the English law system, civics and society, but also some of the community benefits that come from bringing people together and demonstrating the warmth of the welcome and the opportunities that can be found here um, in the UK. So my involvement um, in Lordly began in the aftermath of the evacuation in August 2021. Um, I think like many of you in the room, you will remember just the horror of watching those images and uh, empathising, trying to understand what was being experienced and wondering what, what can be done to help. Most of our participants arrived in the UK in August with family members, both elderly and very young. And in fact, a couple of our participants had babies very early on after arriving in hotel rooms in London. Extraordinary, extraordinary to think of that. And um, our two colleagues who've been working in Kabul had worked alongside the judges, lawyers and prosecutors and had the good understanding um, of the threat that they were under and the experiences that they had had in the evacuation. And having worked alongside the government to identify colleagues who they knew, having worked alongside them, spent time with them and their families, realised that on arriving in the UK, the, the help needed to switch to be practical. Very, very quickly, it became very obvious that what we absolutely needed to help our participants get was that confidence in the English language. It's English language that unlocks all the potential, that all the experience, all the skills, all the expertise they bring with it. But without that English, the, 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 the new home, the new country would remain closed. So very quickly, we raised some funds to launch a pilot class of women judges like Manera um, to prove that in bringing people together and giving me the, the classes, the benefit would come. So we found laptops, we got donations of laptops and the classes began online. The reality was that our participants are all over the country and were being moved at very short notice in many cases. So it had to be online. But actually, I think the college has found a way to really make that work. And participants have six hours of classes a week, um, moving between classes online and some structured, independent work going back into the class after. Alongside these English lessons, we put on weekly law lectures. So this felt very important for two reasons. One, our participants are highly qualified, highly professional people. They are lawyers, they are legal experts. However, Afghan law, English law, very different. So we wanted to acknowledge that and start very simply to say, okay, so here are some of the basic things about English law you should know. Now, the next thing that happened probably won't be a surprise to the lawyers in the room, which is discovering that talking about English law actually is talking about England, it's talking about society, it's talking about <coughs> what we expect of people, what people can expect of the country. It turned into a much broader education about what it's like to live, work, be educated in the UK. 
We've now done over 50 of these lectures. Um, honestly, we're running out of topics um, on the pure law. So we have switched to talk more now about professional development, to be saying to our participants, there are ways back into work in the, in the legal world here for you in the UK. Let's look together at what those might be. So we're talking about um, how education and the law works here, what the different routes into work are, what apprenticeship looks like, what's the, what might a barrister's training be, solicitor's training, all the different ways. Also asking um, magistrates, citizens advice bureau, as many experts as we could think of to come in and talk to our participants about the way that they use law in their work and where skills that our participants have and experience could be applied in this new environment. Everything, of course, comes back to that English language. So the classes um, continue every week and we're adding new participants as they arrive. And there are part new participants arriving slowly, but that gives hope to us that um, the work that you're all doing um, is having an impact. We do ask our participants to turn up regularly. And I think one of the interesting cultural discoveries has been the importance of um, understanding two o'clock classes begin at two o'clock, and so there have been some nice um, differences in the way the cultures work and shifting to say this is how things typically work in the UK, which has been um, really <coughs> interesting and fun to discover some of those differences. Um, beyond the value of the content we hope we offer, so the value of the English lessons um, and the value of the legal information coming through the lectures, our participants talk often of the value of knowing that there are people out there willing to help. So knowing that the generous donors who've supported us, who are individuals and also law firms who've given to support us, knowing that there are people who believe in their potential to contribute here, are glad they're here, want to help, has been really very important. Some of the challenges have been touched on today. Um, our participants, are safe here in the UK with homes. However, there are real difficulties of daily life. There's the deep anxiety about friends and colleagues um, in Afghanistan and the neighboring countries. There's the frustrations with the system as, as they try to help those people arrive here in the UK. And that's what we're spending today talking about. There's the difficulty of establishing family life in a new place, the difficulty of grappling with being in a hotel room, sometimes families eight, nine people in two rooms in the bathroom for months on end without the certainty of where home will be. And when that home might become available, it could be anywhere. And suddenly within a week you're moving and the, the routes that you've placed are uprooted again and schools have to be done again, community found again. So these are really real difficult challenges. There's also grappling with an entirely new education and employment sector. So all that experience, expertise, how does it get applied here? And how do you find the information you need to build, rebuild here in the UK? Um, there are wonderful good news stories coming out. So Fahima, who you heard from earlier, is now herself working. She works four days a week um, alongside a day of study. Piece by piece, individuals are building the paths through and working out how to apply the expertise they have here. Um, having this audience, I do have to say there are two things that we're always after, and I will mention them before I finish. The first inevitably is money for the English lessons. We're all volunteer run, we, we don't employ anyone, so the majority of the money we make from donations goes straight to the English classes. If you know of any organisations that give grants or work for companies that have um, a pot from which they can give, please, please come and find me afterwards. Um, we're enormously grateful for all the donations we get. The second is expertise and network to support our participants as they rebuild here in the UK. So those professional development sessions that we're running online, expertise about um, what it's like to work in, the, in law, whatever form that might take, opportunities that you might see, what you think are useful skills of um, your interviewing or networking, whatever it might be, we're, we'd love to hear from you and bringing people together as well to do in-person sessions has been enormous. I'm going to finish, I feel like I've galloped through all this, um, and I'll share with the website as well so that you can follow up if you would like. Um, I'm going to finish by quoting another of our participants. 
When we lost everything, you helped us. Now the UK is our second homeland and we aim to serve the people in the UK government in the future as we did in Afghanistan. Um, and it's wonderful to hear of all of the energy and the work that's going into making sure these safe routes continue to be available. And we look forward to rebuilding and seeing those achievements come to life here in the UK in the future. Thank you. Very much indeed, Gemma. That was, um, that's really important to know that um, about the work that you're doing, um, and we're very grateful that you can join us. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce our next speaker, um, Emma Simons from Garden Court Chambers, who will be talking about uh, leave outside the um, immigration rules as a possible avenue uh, for Afghan citizens. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to expand a little bit on what both Duran and Sonali have already referred to um, by looking a little bit at leave outside the rules in the Philippine deal. Um, so the purpose of this session really is to try and answer three questions. What is leave outside the rules? Why is it relevant to the Afghan context? And how it can possibly be a remedy for this particular client cohort? So first of all, leave outside the rules obviously be very familiar to many of you in the room, but it's the residual discretion that Secretary of State has to grant leave to enter or remain outside the rules. And it's confirmed in the case of Muneer by Lord Dyson that its source is Section 3 of the Immigration Act 1971. And you'll see in paragraph 44, I think it's just worth emphasising at the outset, the second sentence from Lord Dyson, the Secretary of State is given a wide discretion under sections 3, 3 A, B, C to control the grant and refusal of leave to enter or remain. And then he goes on to say, the language of these provisions, especially 3, 1, B, C, could not be wider. They provide clearly and without qualification that where a person is not a British citizen, he may be given leave to enter, and then goes on limited leave indefinitely. So, very clear statement from Lord Dyson that the discretion is broad, which is important. Um, in addition to the discretion itself, there's also guidance from the Secretary of State that's um, been published. It's worth keeping an eye on the version <laughs> that you're working with, because since even the Afghan cases have been in progress since 2021, we're now on version <coughs> three, um, which was recently updated in August of this year. So if we look at the guidance now in a little bit of detail. Some aspects of the guidance are helpful for making representations about Afghan nationals and some are less helpful that we just have to deal with. So the first point to emphasise is that the guidance itself acknowledges that what caseworkers should be doing is a highly individualised assessment and the guidance itself recognises that discretion <laughs> is applied in different ways depending on the context. So the context of your client's case is going to inform the extent to which the Secretary of State may take a favourable view <laughs> of the facts and their circumstances. And I think that we can safely say that this is a particularly exceptional context given the policy history that's gone before. Less helpfully, the policy also recognises that grants of LTR are rare. But as we'll come on to look at, there is some precedent for this cohort in particular to have access to that remedy. In terms of the test, the policy refers to compelling compassionate circumstances. That's framed in very broad terms. The policy gives some non-exhaustive examples such as crises, accidents, emergencies, etc. Um, and then finally, in procedural terms, the policy makes the point that an RAP form cannot be used for an LOTR application. And obviously that builds upon what the Court of Appeal found in SNAZ. However, that doesn't mean that there isn't access to LOTR. Why is it relevant then for this particular context? Well, we know from the SNAZ litigation that the government itself used LOTR as a mechanism for relocating Afghan citizens. Sonali's already alluded to this in, in her uh, session earlier on this afternoon, but the evidence before the court identified that the Civil service advice was to evacuate more than just British citizens and Arab eligible individuals, but also subject to capacity other categories of Afghan citizens. And officials would propose categories, ministers would approve them. The evidence from the FCDO itself is that they understood that this was distinct from Arab, 
So it's a distinct process operating alongside our hub. It was described by them internally as pitting our TR and unhelpfully it was not by application. So anyone who was outside of our app was not able to put themselves forward to be identified for pitting LOTR. In the SNAZ judgment, Mrs Justice Lang gives a very helpful and detailed summary of that evidence. And in particular, paragraph 11, she summarises what was the selection criteria that the government applied. Um, I should say this is a, an abbreviated version. There's a bit more text in paragraph 11, but for our purposes, um, I think it's sufficient to identify that there's a contribution to HMG objectives, vulnerability due to proximity of my harm and exposure, working with HMG, and sensitivity of the individual's role. Um, you also had to, everyone has to meet contribution, and then you have to meet either or vulnerability or sensitivity. The most important, I think, paragraphs in it, of, of Mrs. Justice Lang's decision are set out in paragraphs 124 to 126. Um, and what she does there, she analyzes the particular cases of S and AZ, who were two Afghan judges, neither of whom qualified under ARAP, but nonetheless had good reasons for saying that they should be entitled to be relocated to the UK. And she found, based on all of the evidence that was before the court, that there were clear indicators of lobbying and arbitrary process in terms of who was identified during pitting LOTR. And that's unsurprising, bearing in mind, not just the chaos of the circumstances, but the fact that policy is being developed ad hoc, and also there's no application process. On the facts, she found that there was no rational distinction between the claimants and the judges who were evacuated under pitting LOTR. Um, and although the policy for pitting LOTR was finished because it was tied to the evacuation, it doesn't mean that it's irrelevant and that your, fa your clients factors such as what is their contribution to HMG's mission, um, how vulnerable are they as a result of that work, are they in a sensitive role, all of that still remains relevant. Um, and she expressly dealt with that paragraph 126 of the judgment. So if you're going to read any particular paragraphs, I think these are the key ones in her quite lengthy judgment. Looking then how we use that judgment as a kind of stepping stone then to individual LOTR applications. Um, there's a further case in the Upper Tribunal, which Duran's already alluded to, it's the case of JZ, which we've been working with on Vincent Ali and Arena and, and Rachel from Wilson's here for, for some time. And this is the culmination of all of the litigation previously, which is essentially that we have two actual decisions now refusing leave to enter the UK. Um, and those were subject to challenge before the tribunal. Uh, you should just know, I think, that those decisions were perhaps a product of their time in the sense that this predated the Court of Appeal ruling on SNAZ about the ARAP form. And so we were able to obtain the in-principle decisions without um, making a buff of the visa application form. And also we were able to persuade the court in the interim um, context that it was appropriate to make the decision absent biometrics. I appreciate the landscape is a bit more difficult <coughs> because we've got the biometrics policy which Dave is going to deal with, but it's still an important indicator that the court is prepared to make the Secretary State actually take action in these cases, um, especially when there's been prolonged delay and there are individuals at risk. The case is also really important, I think, for highlighting the value of disclosure in these cases because consistently, I think one of the themes from today is that no matter what pathway you look at, there is a real lack of transparency and all routes are very opaque. Um, and there are two key things that came out of the disclosure process with respect to JZ. The first was that he was in fact about to be considered by a panel at the time of the evacuation, but that was deferred and never actually took place because of the security events on the ground. And the second, is that JZ actually worked in the same court as the judges who were evacuated under ARAP, albeit he worked there at an earlier period, and so was not in post at the time of the evacuation. So the decision from the Upper Tribunal, it's a panel decision from Judges Sheridan and Williams, does three things, and for the next three slides, I've just given you the full text of the paragraph, so I think it's quite helpful for future cases. The first is, is that the tribunal confirmed that supporting evidence submitted after a negative ARAP decision as to the individual's contribution to the rule of law should have been considered by the entry clearance decision maker. 
So all of the evidence about the qualitative value of a person's contribution to HMG's mission is still relevant in the entry clearance context. And you'll see here, that's paragraph 96 of the judgment where that's set out in some detail. The second point is that the upper tribunal also helpfully indicated that just because a person has a negative ARAP decision isn't the end of the, of the question, essentially, that the, the, the Secretary of State has to do more than that in order to safely address the compassionate compelling test. And in this particular case, there were very detailed representations and evidence before the decision makers which specifically invited them to look at the weight to be attached to this individual's contribution. And the court considered that that had been marginalised and not properly dealt with. And then the final point, which the court dealt with, paragraphs 99, is that it endorsed the very helpful but obiter paragraphs from Mr Justice Lyme's judgment, and it considered that they were persuasive. So I think that shows potentially what might be a helpful route forward in terms of how you use the LOTR route in addition to the ARAP pathways. So in terms of practically what we can do in these cases, I think the first point to emphasise is that we have to be looking at the cases from the outset in terms of policy and discretion, and that we have to be working around framing the discretion case as the same time as the ARAP case. I also think it's really important to request disclosure as early as you possibly can, because as we've seen from JZ and indeed SNAZ, there are often aspects of the client's particular case that may be very helpful to explain um, issues like delay or why their contribution has been considered less material and you can then address that in representations. Um, and then just in terms of what are relevant considerations for compelling compassionate, um, again, it's about mapping how the ARAP criteria would work in the discretion context, plus the additional factors. So thinking through those three criteria identified by the SCDO. And also clients' current circumstances, remembering that the policy ex express that humanitarian concerns are also highly relevant, and also obviously the position of family members as well. I think hopefully that's some happier practical news. <coughs> Yes, um, I think it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, that's really helpful in giving us some um, rationality to some of these decisions and giving us um, a way forward, perhaps under LOTR. Um, next, we have David Selwood, who will be talking to us about the tricky subject of biometrics. Thank you very much, Sharona. Yes, I'm going to talk very briefly about biometrics. A preliminary but obvious point, the litigation arising after the Taliban takeover in August 2021 in the, um, in the UK has almost always been um, wrapped up with matters of procedure rather than substantive law. For example, um, what constitutes a visa application form for the purposes of applying for entry clearance? That question made its way all the way to the Court of Appeal in SNAZ. The question of biometrics is no different. It's another procedural hurdle uh, to having claims considered substantively on the merits. The requirement to enrol biometrics applies across the immigration rules. For our purposes, the relevant provisions are under the 2008 regulations, which are self-explanatory. Uh, regulation 3A requires anyone applying for entry clearance to apply for the issue of a, bi a biometric immigration document. That requirement is mandatory, as we shall see. Regulation 5 gives the Secretary of State a very broad discretion to waive that requirement, and as you'll see from the slide. Note also that Regulation 7 concerns children under 16 who are not required to provide fingerprints or photographic evidence unless they're in the presence of a parent, guardian, or someone who takes responsibility for them. So the Afghan context in respect of biometrics is, of course, important. That's why we're here today. The requirement to enrol biometrics to apply for entry clearance or relocation to the UK is particularly challenging for Afghan nationals. There's no visa application centre, of course, in Afghanistan. The British Embassy closed there in 2021. 
that's the place where you would normally enroll your biometrics. That means that individuals are forced, or seeking leave uh, from Afghanistan, uh, are forced into other avenues, and that potentially requires them to leave the country and to go to other neighbouring countries in the hope that their visa application can be processed there. The individuals that we're concerned about seeking leave from Afghanistan, Afghanistan constitute a particularly vulnerable cohort of individuals, as we know. Many are likely to be at real risk of serious harm for one, for one reason or another, and they include judges, prosecutors, military and government officials, journalists, social activists, the list goes on. The extent of the risk for those individuals uh, is well known and accepted even by the respondent by the Home Office in the CPIN of April 2022. So what are the options? As I said, the nearest VACs are likely to be in Pakistan or, in, uh, or Iran, but travel to either of those is likely to involve very serious and significant risks and precarious status and danger once there. All of this begs the question, how are, are a majority of individuals realistically going to be able to register their biometric details? Um, that's a question I'll come back to, but, but it's worth bearing in mind. What have the courts made of the requirement to uh, provide biometrics or the biometric enrolment? All of the cases that I'm about to very quickly run through um, are not uh, predate the Secretary of State's unsafe journey policy. Um, which was published um, this year. But it's helpful to look at them to see how we got to where we are. So first up in SGW, the upper tribunal pointed out the mandatory requirement under regulation 3A uh, of the regs that we've just been through and the discretion under five, regulation five and eight also that we've looked at. It declared that Secretary of State's then policy guidance on family reunion was unlawful to the extent that it didn't confirm the existence of any discretion as to the provision of biometric information, bar in respect of children under five years old. In JZ, um, that you've already heard about, in the interim relief judgment, Mrs Justice Leaven granted relief to the claimant by ordering the Secretary of State to make an in principle decision on JZ's eligibility to enter the UK before he had provided his biometrics. And that relief was granted on the basis that the Secretary of State had failed to apply her discretion to defer biometrics in a rational manner, taking into account the individual facts um, of the case in question of JZ, uh, particularly bearing in mind that she had clear and convincing evidence of his identity. In S and AZ, again, that something uh, that you've already heard about that's been covered, two former Afghan judges sought leave outside rules. At that point, there was no provision for them to seek a biometrics waiver or defer uh, when applying for leave outside the rules, something which Mrs Justice Lang concluded was irrational and procedurally unfair. In MRS, uh, a challenge to the Secretary of State's refusal again to defer biometrics until an after in principle decision was made. At that time, deferment was only granted where there were quote unquote exceptional and extraordinary circumstances. And the applicants in that case argued that the requirement was unlawful on public law grounds and breached Article 8 of the ECHR in failing to strike a fair balance in misdirecting decision makers as to determine as to how to determine such applications. The Upper Tribunal concluded that the policy breached Article 8 because it misdirected decision makers by including a misleading statement on the law, i.e. the need for extraordinary <coughs> circumstances. It also concluded on the facts that the decision to refuse to make an in-principle decision in the absence of biometrics disproportionately feared interfered with the applicant's Article 8 right. In KA, another case concerning Afghan nationals seeking entry clearance, there was a challenge against the Secretary of State's refusal to consider their applications without providing, with, without them providing their biometrics. And it's fair to say that the Secretary of State's position developed during those proceedings, 
the one described by the court as quote unquote flexible, and to the point where she accepted, Secretary of State accepted that she would in fact consider substantive entry clearing applications from the claimants, including whether or not to defer the biometrics requirements, rendering that aspect of the claim academic. And then finally, in the case of AB, the claimant argued it was discriminatory to require her, an Afghan national, to provide biometrics in contrast to a Ukrainian national who sought relocation under the Ukrainian family scheme, where biometric data was not required before the application was processed or even before they entered the United Kingdom. In that case, Mrs. Justice Levin accepted that there was differential treatment between the two categories of individuals <coughs> on the basis of nationality, but concluded that the defendant was entitled or was able to justify that difference on diplomatic and foreign policy considerations and national security issues. No permission to appeal uh, has been granted in that matter, and I think it's due to be heard substantively uh, early next year, 2024, in, in the Court of Appeal. So that brings us on to the Home Office's publication, um, unable to travel to a visa application centre to enrol in biometrics. Uh, and that came into force in May of this year. It's not exclusive to applicants from Afghanistan, but in practice it will regularly apply in the context of applications from Afghan nationals. It provides guidance for determining whether to predetermine an application for entry clearance or excuse an individual from attending a VAC to enrol their biometric information. The underlying purpose of obtaining biometrics is reiterated at page six of the guidance. Biometrics underpin the current UK immigration system to support identity insurance and suitability checks on foreign nationals who are subject to immigration control. They enable comprehensive checks to be made against immigration and criminality records to identify those who pose a threat to national security, public safety, immigration controls, or are likely to breach UK laws if they're allowed to come to the United Kingdom. The guidance outlines steps that the app that applicants have to take in order for those matters to be considered. It's at page 10. They have to have applied using the correct route for the circumstances in question and the correct application form. They have to provide evidence supporting their request for predetermination or being excused from attending a VAC to provide biometrics, including by explaining why other alternatives are not available. And the expectation, according to the Home Office, is that individuals should resolve any challenges in coming to the UK themselves or delay their journey if they're unable to travel to a VAC. <laughs> Key to the policy is the four criteria that are outlined at page 12. First, individuals have to satisfy the Secretary of State that they are uh, of their identity to a reasonable degree of certainty before coming to the United Kingdom. Second, and this is key, they must provide evidence they need to make an urgent journey to a VAC that would be particularly unsafe for them based on the current situation within the area they are located and along the route where they would travel to reach the VAC to enrol their biometrics. And they cannot delay their journey until later or use alternative routes. Third, they have to demonstrate their circumstances are so compelling as to make them exceptional, which goes beyond simply joining relatives who are living in the UK. And an example given is where a UK-based sponsor requires full-time care and there are no other viable alternatives to meet the sponsors or the young children's needs. And then fourth and final, they must confirm they're able to travel to any VAC if they want their application to be predetermined or where they're requesting decision makers to excuse them from the requirement to attend the VAC to enrol their biometrics. And they need to explain why they cannot attend any VAC but are able to travel to the UK. The policy goes on and provides further guidance on those four requirements, much of which is, um, uh, is sensitive material and not disclosed to the public, which is rather unhelpful, to say the least. 
Finally, problems with the policy. Um, how does the safe journey policy work in practice? Well, it's quite difficult to say at this stage. It's still relatively new and there are no reported authorities addressing its application. There is, however, a case, case of AB to be heard in the upper tribunal later this year or early next year, which will touch on this. But at this stage, I think it's worth making at least three quick points. I'm conscious of time. Uh, first, definitions. A number of passages within the policy are ambiguous and potentially difficult to follow in practice. Consider, for example, the policy's requirement of quote unquote objective evidence to show the individual will potentially be at risk of harm. What constitutes objective evidence? Does that place the threshold too high? How is that going to be determined by decision makers in practice? Does it fetter the Secretary of State's wide discretion? As we've seen from the previous cases I mentioned, SGW and MRS, terminology within the policies matters. Second, there's no distinction between those who seek in principle decisions and those who seek a waiver of the biometric requirement altogether. Why? Waiving the biometrics requirement altogether obviously has more significant ramifications for the Secretary of State than simply predetermining an application. Is the public interest in deferring a waiver not different and arguably stronger than declining to make a predetermination decision? Third, individual facts, of course, still <coughs> they will be important, indeed determinative, as to whether key criteria two and three are met. As a result, it remains really important to evidence what the journey to a BAC will require and why, in your particular case, there are very there are compelling circumstances. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, that's very interesting. Um, and just to share one thought with you that, that came up uh, from me from the talk so far, um, there may be an interesting interplay between the level of risk that's being applied and the unsafe journeys policy in the criteria that um, David's just outlined and the risk that we looked at under our app. And you might want to think very carefully about those cases that, for example, don't have a decision on our app uh, because of the delay that we'll hear about in a moment and how the decision on LOTR and pushing for a biometrics may affect um, the, the our app decision. Uh, anyway, these are these are just uh, this is just one thought uh, in this uh, rich area. Um, Rebecca Chapman is next to, to talk about delay. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I was thinking about this. I was in Birmingham earlier today, travelling back. Really, I think this section is about judicial review, and so it's it's a bit um, diffuse because of the nature of the cases and the claims that are being made. So um, the focus, though, is going to be firstly on challenging delay in ARAP cases, both the delay in reaching decision by the Secretary of State or indeed the um, Ministry of Defence. And secondly, and this is potentially a novel idea that I have stolen from someone else, which I will attribute, the delay in making a decision on a review of the ARAP decision. Now, as you're probably aware at the moment, if you get an ARAP decision after however many months or even years, uh, the Home Office say, no, you can't judicially review now, uh, you have a review. So there is a potential challenge to that, which I will discuss. And then also what to do about leave outside the rules, both the process and the decisions. So the current position, and I apologise because the reception on the train was really terrible. Someone may have already given you this information, but essentially the Minister for the Armed Forces made a public statement in Parliament uh, that the Ministry of Defence were processing Arab applications at pace, thanks to recruiting more police workers and improved systems and processes. 
that they had made 12,200 decisions January to April this year, and they aimed to process all outstanding initial applications by August. Now, I think we'll all be aware we're about to be in November, <laughs> and <laughs> most people still have outstanding cases that they have not reached. So I think if, if you do have somebody <coughs> in that situation, I'm not aware of any, it's not a watered down statement. I'm not aware of anything subsequently. It says, oh, sorry, now it's going to be actually August 2024. So it is worth looking at the particular case and the delay in that particular case and maybe sending off pre-action correspondence asking for reasons asking when a decision might be made asking why no decision has been made i think the, the general understanding was that they would deal with the, the cases that they could grant first um, so it may be that if you have clients then they are in this area where more time needs to be spent looking at them and deciding what to do about them. So in terms of the delay, so far, it's not been a very happy, um, it's not been happy for anyone, either in terms of obviously people waiting to have their case decided, or in terms of the response by uh, the courts. Um, in my experience, the Home Office are rather ridiculously still relying on the old case of FH. That was the delay case in front of Mr. Justice Collins from 2007. The reference is EWHC 1571, um, which actually really has no relevance because that was in the context of a backlog of the Secretary of State's own volition. And essentially, there was a challenge to the lawfulness of the way that the Home Office were trying to prioritise the backlog. And unfortunately, Mr Justice Collins essentially concluded that the, the system, if it was being applied fairly and consistently, uh, couldn't show that de delays were unreasonable. So I think the first point to think about with that is, well, is there any consistency? Um, because I don't think there is. Now, whether through RLG or one of the various move, other online groups, we can actually get statistics together about the type of cases that are being decided and the process. And I think that would be good and helpful to try and show inconsistent and arbitrary decision-making, which let's face it, is what is happening here. And then I think also just in terms of the conclusion, um, Mr Justice Collins, I think, has also scope. He's saying, well, unless it's sort of manifestly unreasonable, but in those cases, these were individuals who'd made, had a failed asylum claim and then had made a fresh claim, and they were waiting for a decision on that. In many of these cases, people are in dire circumstances, either in Afghanistan or Pakistan. So delays of, of this nature are clearly manifestly unreasonable. But it is important to just consider the venue. And the reason I say that is that um, I had a case with my lovely colleague, Eva Dua, um, earlier in the year, where if you can see it was someone who'd worked as an interpreter. The delay at that stage was in fact nine months, so less in fact than some other cases, but he is, was still in Afghanistan and still extremely concerned about his safety. And we brought a challenge in the upper tribunal. And there was a, the respondent disputed that, or the, it's a respondent, it's a UT, disputed that that was the right venue, which probably they were right, because obviously the, the MOD are involved in the Arab decision making. Nevertheless, the tribunal kept it. And we argued that there had been excessive and unreasonable delay in the particular circumstances of that person and in light of the country evidence and upper tribunal judge sheridan did grant us permission and you can see the reference number and i have the client's permission to refer to this of course what happened next is before we could even get to a substantive hearing to actually litigate the issue more fully there was an immediate refusal of his arab application so the, there was nothing 
more we could do. We got a decision, it was negative, we reviewed it, and then is awaiting the outcome. So we were, we were outmaneuvered, but that's not to say that the judge and the tribunal were not prepared to intervene, because they were. Um, and I think would continue to be interested in intervening. So this is the this is my stolen idea, and this is from refugee legal support from uh, Zofia and from Isaac. And we have some other team members here today. So I don't know where you're at with your Arab reviews, but I think with that poor client, we're almost I think we're almost nine months on the Arab review. So the same length of time as in relation to the Arab decision. I think that there is, and I agree with the RLS lawyers, that there is an argument that the review is not a meaningful alternative remedy because it's so slow. So A, you're not getting uh, a decision quickly, and B, I don't know, but are you getting a different decision on review? And C, how do you review something when, in any event, the decision doesn't particularise what the basis of the refusal is because it just it's like throwing mud at the wall it just says no you don't qualify right through so i am hoping that a challenge can get off the ground um, on this basis and so in fact that will really take away any weight to be attached to the review it's and to negate it effectively this hasn't happened yet, but do, if you've got cases, then by all means get in touch with me or with RLS, and it may be that we can do some kind of joint challenge as to, um, as to what can be done in relation to that. So I'm afraid this is probably my best news of the night in terms of being a bit positive about something that we might be able to do, hopefully. It's definitely worth a try. Um, so this, and I'm sure you've been alerted to this, is also terrible that Pakistan are basically saying, and I, I understand it's because there have been increasing activity by Pakistan Taliban, so it's really a pressure tactic on the Afghan Taliban to stop supporting the Pakistan Taliban, that they want to deport everyone um, today from here on and my understanding also from the UNHCR and the other reports is in fact they have already been deporting people over one of the land borders so that's frankly terrifying but it does also mean if you're representing applicants that again this is something that we can try and weaponize effectively for expedition and it's it, we can put that evidence in PAC correspondence and just say look you've really got to decide this because this is real and there is evidence that can be relied on. So um, this is something that I read about Ben Aruma, another barrister. He is involved in this case, and I think he posted on free movements. So I got in touch with him. There was a hearing on Friday. But essentially, this is very interesting because there seems to have been a secret policy. No surprises there. Uh, that even though people were found to qualify under ARAP, they decided not, the Home Office decided not to bring them over because they couldn't find suitable non-hotel accommodation. So they were just stuck in Pakistan, and some of them still are. So there is a, a challenge with a number of different claimants, as you can see, in the High Court. Um, and hopefully there will be orders saying that those people need to be brought. That may have happened already. I really hope so. If anyone knows, please tell me. We can talk about it in the questions. So that is also really good news. It's not the only bit of good news. Um, and then, yes, leave outside the rules application. So in a recent case that I'm involved with, with Roshan, hi Roshan, <laughs> and Irena. Um, <laughs> This is an outrageous case. This is round two of the judicial review because what happened in this case, we, we had to make a leave outside the rules application because of the case law that said an Arab application doesn't count as a leave outside the rules. So we made the application some time ago. I mean, the original application was literally within two months of the Taliban taking over. But I think that the current application was made last September for family reunion because it's free, 
And frankly, what nothing is really the right application form in these circumstances. And then we had a letter saying that that application is now invalid because the applicants haven't registered their biometrics, even though it had obviously been made very clear to the Secretary of State that they couldn't register their biometrics because they were still in Afghanistan and there was nowhere to do it. And that actually the unsafe journeys guidance applied to them because he was very much at risk and had young children and an elderly mother. And it was just not possible or fair to expect them to travel over the border to Pakistan. So there, if that's one of the arguments. Um, and obviously there is a delay aspect to this very much, although our first judicial review was on delay, but there's still delay, there's still no ARAP decision. Tactically, we decided not to raise that at this stage and to go for the upper tribunal in the hope that we might get something from them uh, and that it just might prompt a decision which we could then challenge and try ultimately and get our client and his family here. So that is um, what I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, thank you very much. Um, again, please forgive me, but just a couple of um, thoughts about that really mm. interesting talk. And uh, I don't think any talk about delay is going to be uplifting. Um, but just on the question of um, biometrics again and tying it into the um, declaration by Pakistan for everyone to evacuate by the 1st of November, um, that really should be in everyone's minds when making applications for biometric deferral. It seems to me that that constitutes a really good reason why it's not feasible or possible for somebody to go to the nearest country in Pakistan. Um, and secondly, on the secret policy point, um, the, that did be, uh, come before the court, I think, on the 20th, um, and Lisa Giovanetti, um, Casey, who was representing the government, made undertakings that the policy was changed. Again, some other people in the room may be representing. Um, but that is formally uh, a change in the government policy, and we wait to see what effect that has on the ground. The flights are here, They've, the people are arriving. <clears throat> 3,000 people will, be, will have arrived by the end, by month, by next week. Okay. So, Just on the on. Uh, biometrics point and yeah. going to Pakistan or not going, one of the issues in the case that I mentioned, MRS, was that the applicants were going to have to go back and forth to Pakistan, I think three or four occasions. Yeah. So when the upper tribunal concluded that was a disproportionate interference in their Article 8 rights, that was a weighty factor. It was that constant back and forth and the risks that arose from that. So it's important to, to get that in perspective and yeah. um, to think about how in practice that's going to interfere with your Article 8 rights. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, last but by no means least, uh, Shamim Sarabi from R RLS um, and as Rebecca indicated, um, one of the uh, uh, legal organisations who are leading the thinking, really, uh, in this field. Um, Shamim, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Sahana, for being here. Um, yeah, I'm Shamim Sarabi, working with the APBI project. Uh, I just want to um, um, a little bit with you and um, overview of what's APBI and what services we are providing for Afghans. Um, Afghan Pro Bono Initiative, or APBI, established by a two um, charity organization, Refugee Legal Support and Safe Passage, with support of 14 law firms. Um, this is uh, four of us in the team, uh, Mariana Descartes, our project coordinator, uh, Becky Hart and Helena Collin, we have them in the room, uh, supervising lawyer, and I am um, connecting the project with the community. Um, so, aim of this project is to provide uh, legal representation and uh, legal advice to Afghans who are seeking protection, um, either eligible under ARP schemes or they are looking for any opportunities to join their family members in the UK. 
um, and the case workers with the support of uh, volunteers, lawyers working hard um, to, um, to um, fulfill this commitment of the project. Uh, unfortunately, due to a very high level of demands, a project is not currently taking any new case in that area. But um, we are um, continuing to provide our services through other ways, um, which is um, another component of project is providing um, reliable um, legal information for Afghans who are seeking protection. And we are conducting information sessions and legal um, clinics. I'm just thinking about Afghans. Today afternoon, we have talked a lot about Afghans when they are in Afghanistan what situation they are and how are their situation. Just a little bit more, I'm explaining that, that part. Um, thinking Afghans, they are living in fear and in desperate situation to find a safety for them, for themselves and their family members, especially those they work with the youth forces in Afghanistan during the last decades. Um, and now they're looking for any way possible to save the life of themselves and their family members. And some of them may not have that um, knowledge of English language. When they're referring to uh, government websites, they have to find a way out of that very complicated um, text explained about the schemes or any family reunions. So it might be easy for lawyers or those they have legal background, but it is not easy for those they don't have any legal background and it's not in your own language as well. And not forget that many Afghans do not have that um, ability of reading and writing as well. So now we can imagine how hard it is for them to find the information they need from the materials on the website of the government. Uh, to fill that gaps, we are uh, facilitating online informa information session uh, where the lawyers are explaining about the Arab schemes, ACRS scheme, or who are eligible under Arab scheme, if they are eligible, how they can submit an application, um, who uh, from their family members can join them, and if they want to join their family members in the UK, what paths are open for them, what potential paths could be open for them. Like if they are a citizen, a British citizen, or they are under humanitarian protection, or a refugee living in the in the UK and want to bring their family members, what are the paths for them? Uh, these things are explained by the lawyers, and their uh, interpretation are also provided during this uh, session. And the feedbacks usually received from our participants is that is that the very complicated uh, legal matters are explained in a very simple language, which we appreciate our lawyers for providing this service. I'm also now thinking about Afghans there in the UK. They have been separated from their family members during, either during the evacuation or before that, or after that, and um, there is a trauma in the UK living in a foreign country, uh, living in a country uh, again, they speak in a language, it's not their own language, uh, in a different culture. And also, but they are also very desperate to bring their families to the safety as well. They don't have that network, that connections, those people around them, around them in Afghanistan, where they can go from home, they can ask help. And it's also if they want to bring their families through their uh, opening legal case, they need to go to a lawyer if they go to private lawyers they need to have financial support. And it is also a risk living in a country that you don't know much about the community and you know, people around you. It's a risk of being scammed. So how much do you have a chance to get the information, the, the, the supports and information they need? So to respond to these needs, uh, we are um, providing legal clinics and in this legal clinic, uh, the uh, Afghans and their family members, they have a chance to sit with the lawyers face to face, ask their questions, talk about their cases, discuss their matters and ask for clarification. And um, this is a chance for them, even if there is no uh, possible path for them, please, they have received some support and compassion. 
we have talked today about the families, and then I've just remember one point that yes, Afghan families are living together, they are living multi-generational as well, but it is also the uh, family relation in Afghanistan between Afghans are very tight. They are emotionally very uh, connected to each other. And um, it is very hard for them if someone tells them that your parents, your father and mother, cannot get the supports and they are not being counted as a close member of your family. And the definition of immediate family members or your child who just turned 18 is not close family member of you. So it is very hard for them to believe. And this is a really difficult job of the lawyers to explain to them, to explain to them that how these rules are cruel or if it's silly, possible rules for them. And I really appreciate our lawyers and any lawyers that they work with them and provide the support for them. And these all days um, information are provided uh, helped by our um, very um, generous sub, um, volunteer lawyers who are helping with this, with this project and dedicated thousands of hours of their time supporting Afghans. And also it is very important in our legal clinic, maybe mention that's also important to mention that we try, try to provide the reliable information for them so they can make um, informed decision about their situation, even if it's a hard decision. We also provide materials, informative materials for Afghans as well. One of the materials maybe I should particularly mention could be um, useful for some audience of this um, uh, today's um, session, event session. It's uh, our Arab self-help guide. Uh, this is a guide of uh, which um, explains step by step if someone is eligible under category, category four of Arab, how they can prepare their application, how they prepare their supporting documents, how they prepare their evidence, how to submit an application, or how to fill an application, or to submit an application. Or if there is a, a, their application are uh, rejected, uh, how they can request for review, or um, there are some templates have been included in that as well, how to prepare their witness statements or if I have received um, a threat card from the Taliban, where that, that could be useful or how they can use it. So this is a very um, detailed guide uh, available in Dari and Pashto as well. Um, it is an RLS website. Um, if you need to um, refer that one to, uh, you want to circulate that one with your networks, please feel free to refer to the RLS website and find this report. Um, we also provide some uh, frequent asked questions materials as well to answer those some um, questions which we can't, uh, it is beyond the capacity of the project to answer those one by one to each uh, client or those they are referring to us. I'm just briefly talking about our uh, reports, thanks to Sonali referred to our that report today. Um, and, uh, in this report, this report has been uh, prepared by Refugee Legal Support and Safe Passage. And um, a group of lawyers, they work together um, to prepare this report. In this report, we try to highlight um, the issues that clients face for seeking safety and also the challenges the lawyers um, uh, faced uh, working with the cases. We try to document them in this report, and also we have backed them up by um, taking some um, views from our clients as well during the interview um, to bring some views of the clients as well in the report. Um, and the good thing is to mention that some of the findings of these reports have been used just recently in a um, Westminster debate. Um, that, that debate was um, um, led by Mr. Barry Gardner MP and other MPs working with Mr. Gardner. Um, and insisted uh, on, on more attention to the situation of Afghans and speeding up uh, the delayed cases of Afghans. And we are hopeful that uh, material like this could be useful for bringing more attention in the situation, situation of Afghans. One thing to mention that we are um, circulating monthly newsletter. If you want to be in touch with us, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter, uh, APBI project is committed. 
to continue its services for Afghans in the next uh, year. And we are happy to be in touch. And you can find all the updates about our project and our materials um, through this um, news monthly newsletter. And um, just want to say one quote from a from one Afghan from community member who just I've just talked to them recently, and he really insisted that I should uh, transfer his message to anybody I can. Uh, he's he used to work with. Um, UK um, with, with a project funded by UK with uh, British people and he has been left alone without any support. Um, he was taken very serious and compiling serious work in Afghanistan, but he hasn't been received any support. And he's quite angry and he asked me to send a message to you, to anybody you can have. I just want to finish my presentation by giving this quote. Um, he says, uh, when you have been here, I protected you and saved you. Now you're there, what are you doing for me? So this is the message uh, he sent and he asked for everyone to advocate for those they have been left, to find, uh, left behind and um, um, just bring more attention to the situation of Afghans. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, I mean, um, and, and thank you in particular for bringing um, Afghan voices into the room. Um, that's very, very powerful. Um, can I open it up for any <coughs> questions from any of our speakers? or from the rest of the room before I close the session and invite you all for drinks and dinner. Anyone have any questions they'd like to ask openly? I mean, we will be around. Um, I just had a question about, um, I've got a client who made an ARAF application in Afghanistan, we're still in Afghanistan, and um, we're now in the review process. And there's been sort of differing opinion um, from people at uh, the Farmama and also just in general about whether to kind of, I held off initially submitting an LOTR application um, separately because of the kind of lack of clarity about how they were being considered or the issues coming up with biometric deferral and general delay. So at the moment I've just got the ARAP review and there's a bit of a divide in opinion about whether to just keep going with ARAP Yes. see what comes out of that and then you need whatever to potentially help the findings kind of going forward in an NLOTR application subsequently um, or whether to kind of bung it in given the issues arising with like the application expiring when you've got more biometrics and all of that and it's kind of a bit bit hard to decide what to do and whether it's it seems to be double arguments and I just wondered if kind of there was a general consensus or whether there was a sort of divided opinion among I'm happy to start us off. I'm sure. I'm sure that opinions may be divided because you ask two lawyers the same question and you'll get two different answers to those things. Um, I mean, this is this is a common problem, and it's not something that I think you should feel anxious about in terms of anything you should or shouldn't be doing. Um, my my advice on it would be to just really think about the facts of your case. So if you have a very strong case under ARAP, then go for ARAP. Um, on the other hand, aside from the question that, I, that was raised earlier about the LOTR biometrics decision maker determining something prejudicial on the question of risk for the purpose of the ARAP application, but in the context of the LOTR biometrics deferral, subject to that, I can't actually see a disbenefit <coughs> to having both applications running at the same time. Um, and particularly given the delay points, um, you're unlikely to have a decision for a very, very long time on, on either. So focus on the facts, but subject to the risk point, um, I would have thought that you might want to run both at the same time 
I mean, others may take a different view. I mean, one observation I make about delay is that all of the delay cases that I had been involved with, as soon as we issued, we got a decision. And most people's experience has been negative, but I got two positive decisions very on my delay JRs, which then wrapped up and one of them is the judgment when we tried to carry on pursuing it even though it was academic because we wanted reasons as to why there'd been the delay i think it was called nfg and mr justice born gave a judgment but he didn't really give any substantive judgment and i have got permission to appeal really robust terms from another from the court of appeal on a delay case but of course he was then granted and we tried to persuade him to carry on with his case he said he didn't want to of course because he didn't want to rock the boat so I, I think now is the time for robust J, delay JRs def, on our app, without a doubt. And then if there's a two-pronged attack, um, I haven't particularly thought about it doing it both at the same time. But I just don't think there's a... Now, given how far down we are the line two years on, I definitely think it's time to go to, for the delay JR. In any event, plus what Rebecca the hard-edged point about the situation in Pakistan. I mean, I bet the response will come back, go to another country, doesn't have to be Pakistan, go somewhere else, like, you know, go to Iran or whatever. But um, I still think it's a good time to do that. And just one more thought about, um, just thinking of your speech, um, your presentation, Rebecca, and maybe it doesn't go directly to your question, but maybe relevant in the delay um, point, the, the case of FH, I mean, I agree with you entirely, but that's, it's dated and it's irrelevant. But what it, what it does do, which is helpful, is it talks um, in very clear terms about the, the level of unreasonableness being judged by the context. Yeah. And the context, as ever, is the absolute key. And the context of these cases are people who are out of country, at risk, and there is now a question of <coughs> risk because of Pakistan crackdown and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I think it is it is an unhelpful case, but there are things that we can still use yeah. from it to really talk about, to really attack delay um, as unreasonable in this particular context. So maybe maybe that's the way forward. I agree with that. Point, is that um, and this might be impossible to do in practice because the Home Office and the SSD just behave in the way in which they want to. You want, I think you probably want to try and time things so that you have your ARAP decision before you have your LOTR decision. Yeah. Because, um, for the reasons that, uh, that we've been discussing in relation to your JR case, in the, uh, your UTJR case in, in, in JZ, <laughs> if you are going to get some positive findings, if you are going to get some useful stuff, i.e. you're a near-miss case or whatever it might be, then you'd rather feed those into the LOTR application before you've got a negative decision, just because it's always better to um, push forward rather than it is to push back. Um, if, you, if, you've, if, you, if you've nearly got there on our app, you know, nearly, 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 but you've and not yet got LOTR, and any decision on LOTR, then you'd rather be able to say, and now we should have LOTR rather than and now you should reverse your LOTR decision just because yeah, it's I think, I think psychologically easier. Decision as calm as people. Yeah. Um, but I guess that the LOTR it's very difficult to tie. I, I can. I'm saying all of that. Yeah. I'm also recognising well, it's important. I think the LOTR delay is so long. That you mm. yeah. but, but also, there yeah. may be a way around it because um, in S and A Z, we all got stuck on thinking um, Arab is not an immigration route. Well. What the Court of Appeal actually said is that you cannot use the ARAP form to trigger an LOTR decision because it's not an immigration visa. It's not a VAF. It's not an ABAF. But it's an immigration route in that it's in the immigration rules. You know, and, that, and that's, that's always been the case. So what you could do is adopt what Duran is suggesting to say you want your ARAP decision first, but to mitigate against delay, you might want to put the LOTR application in anyway and say, could it please be decided after you decide my ARAP decision under the immigration rules? And that would naturally follow because LOTR is outside the rules and the VAF you have to use, everyone acknowledges, isn't appropriate for the circumstances. So maybe that's the answer. And just on the ARAP decisions and the failure to give reasons, so what I've been doing when I get those, and I've had lots of just the kind of boilerplate 
refusal to send in a letter saying, you know, LND one yeah. um, isn't sufficient. Um, and then I just get a letter back that says, refer to the right of review. And obviously by the time you've got that and you're running out of time, you've only got 90 days and we're working lots of cases. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering if anyone has any kind of thoughts and suggestions. Like, is it best to move straight to doing a pre-action letter, trying to get disclosure? I mean, they're going to say there's a right of review. Is the argument, you know, it's not an adequate alternative because there is no meaningful right to, you know, a review in these circumstances where we're essentially in the dark, the clients are in the dark, and these are obviously the cases we're working on and we can try and push for some disclosure, whereas, you know, other clients are just submitting this review request form completely in the dark. So I just wonder whether, you know, if together we can share some maybe experiences and suggestions yeah, I think, uh, how we do that. I think, I think, I think the, whole, the whole point about reasons, the whole, the whole rationale of, of, of one of the rationales of reasons is so that you can challenge, so that you can challenge the decision. <laughs> yeah. if, the, if the challenge is a review, is review, because of course, you know, as soon as you try and challenge, they'll say, if the decision JR, directly by JR, they'll say, well, you've got a right to review. So if the challenge is by way of review, and that's not effective because you have not got a, um, you, you have not got your reasons and you don't know what you're pushing back against. Mm. That's the whole point. So I'd say, I'd, I'd say get in there and try to force the, yeah. Try to force the reason. Try to force the reasons by way of a pap, um, pap at this stage. And you might even think then of, um, of, of if they refuse, you say, look, you know, I want to do this right. I want to, I want to do go through the review, which is your process, etc. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be effective. So please give me the reasons, mm -hmm. and then I will, and then we will be able to build our case and go to our review because it's a de novo review. And then if they refuse, and at that point you can start saying, well, then we'll have to jail the actual, we'll have to jail the decision itself. Because we're not going to sit around and wait for a review that's totally meaningless. Because we don't know what the decision, because we don't, because we don't know what the, what the reasons are. Could be flipping anything. Um, we don't know what the top, where the target is. Um, what's, so, being, yeah, that's what's, how yeah. what's being reviewed? Yeah. If there's no reasons. Well, we've had that in experience, actually. Oscar, who's from Duncan Lewis. I mentioned this earlier, we managed to, in the pre-action, get the reasons via disclosure. So we said, you can't make reps because you've just said it's category four, but we won't give you any reason. But then they annexed all of the disclosure. When we look through the disclosure, they actually have never done a proper eligibility exercise. So it's classic LND1. We don't know him. He never worked for us. We don't know any officials. And so then we were able to put that in the report and say, it's actually a proper LND1 case moving error. But like I said before, PAP was totally incoherent because they said, we're not going to give you disclosure in the review. Well, that's <laughs> the hybrid of Rebecca's response and Duran's response is, that's why I want expedition, because if I've got to do my review within this period of time, but I can't do it meaningfully until you give me the reasons, then give me, I, it, there's a reason why I should have my my expedition in the JR uh, and the PAP response. I want it now because otherwise I run out of time, unless you extend time for the review brackets, I don't necessarily want that, um, to to get the reasons. So I think there's a, there's a that's structurally a reason for going for expedition. I think we have one, one more question. Right, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. It's been really enlightening and interesting. Um, in the, and the issue, uh, the, the young people I work with from Afghanistan are not Arab cases at all. Mm. Um, and Samim was a little bit addressing those, those kind of cases. I would like to ask you all where we find lawyers, because all of the <laughs> solicitors I contact... <laughs> so do you have any ideas about what might... I mean, I have got, where I work, 40 Afghan young people who want family reunion. And I have tried many, many solicitors and Afghan pro bono and all sorts of places. And I just wonder if you have any ideas about what can be done, because they, they're not going to be able to manage themselves and yeah. to do the cases because they're too complicated. And do they have social workers? They, some have social workers, but many don't. I think trying to put the obligation on the social worker, because that is a, they are, that is a part of their role. To, to find solicitors and to pay for, and to facilitate legal advice, that is their that's their job, and that's they're sort of supposed to be you know quasi parental role, responsibility for young people. In fact, most of our young people have been age disputed. Uh, yeah. 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 That's a whole other. Issue. If there are ones with social workers, I do think that that is a good that's first port. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good idea. So Sheila, um, RLS also has a family reunion from Europe project. 
and some caseworkers. Obviously, their waiting lists are not huge capacity, but you could try getting in touch. So which is that? Um, so refugee legal support. So as well as the APVI that Shamim was talking about, there's a family reunion from Europe, which was really set up to deal with the transition post Dublin regulation cases. So they do take family reunion cases, not exclusively Afghani, but obviously quite a quite a lot. And yes, I mean you could ask people to do it direct access to approach barristers. They are a lot of work though, there is no denying it. If you want to do it successfully, yes. I've been doing quite a lot. They, it's worth doing. There's a lot of work, yeah. It's worth front loading, isn't it? Yeah, it's worth it really is. In that, you know, and front loading and making your facts really clear from the start, yeah. you know, to save you the independent social work report. Yeah. I mean, of course, all subject to funding, but try and evidence as much as possible the adverse impacts. But we can talk about it afterwards. Thank you. For that. I just wanted to say thank you very much um, for coming and participating. Um, I found it a very humbling and inspirational day. Um, uh, thank you again for coming. Please stay for drinks, and I hope to see you downstairs. <laughs> downstairs, yeah. Thank you.